Hello, hello. Hello, everybody. We have got a really interesting um, episode planned for today. It's about play and parties because parties are a part of play. However, this episode is Tom's pitch, so I feel like he belongs in the hot seat. Boop, Tom. <laughs> hey. <clears throat> so, since we have been talking about Everything else, we need to thrive <clears throat> and keep noticing, hey, it's also everything kids need. Let's flip this table and go with, here's something we know kids need, but you know what? As adults, we need to. We just pretend we don't. And it's play and it's parties and it's socializing and it's feeling like we're part of a group. Mm. And how do we do that? Some of us start to notice, like, actually, the older we get, as we start to get our stuff together, we go, wait, why is it harder for me to go to parties? Mm -hmm. um, why is it harder for me to socialize? And that's kind of what we're here to talk about, mm -hmm. is how you can still have fun at a party, throwing a party, but also, how do you play? Like, sometimes as an adult, our past experiences kind of get in the way of what is it to play with someone else? Of, you know, one of the things I love in a good sports movie is when they bring up, if it's a professional um, sport, that you're being paid to play a game. It's not life or death. It's supposed to be for fun. Mm -hmm. If you ain't having fun doing this, you need to find something else to do. Mm -hmm. Like the whole reason we watch all these sports on, you know, streaming services and on cable and, and um, listen to it on the radio is it's fun. It's exciting. It's something to join in on. We all have different ways that we want to play. Like, you know, we now have so many online games where we can play by ourselves. We can play cooperatively. Mm -hmm. We can play against other people and get some aggression out. Just like we do in real life. Of, you know, there's healthy ways to do this, and there's really not healthy. And that's all the stuff we're going to talk about today, of the healthy, the fun, avoiding the unhealthy, how to stay friends, how to build up new friendships. As adults, it's hard to make new friends. Play and parties is a great way to do it. So that's sort of my pitch about what we want to talk about today. Cool. Because, I mean, uh, Gloria and I both have been, I didn't, I was not able to finish because some problems, but Gloria fully went through, you know, the educator's licensing, licensure program, you know, through college. And we both took a lot of the same courses and we both had the same reaction when we've heard over the last two decades, a lot of school districts talk about, we're going to remove recess because they're not learning well enough mm. in school. And it's. Like, it's one thing when this is in high school, hmm. but when you talk about elementary and removing recess, it's like these kids aren't going to learn anything no matter what you do. That. Because you kids need physical movement. We all need physical movement in part to help us process the facts we've learned. Like, this is actually a known thing. Um, when you see kids get all antsy and shifting around in their seat, and there's no, it's not like, you know, because they got to go to the bathroom. I'm not mm -hmm. sure when the right time to ask is. It's because their brain's trying to process and they need physical kinesthetic movement to process the thoughts and memories they've just made. And humans aren't that different. We, we get a little bit better about it and able to control, but for our memory and for our emotions, we still need physical movement. That's why... Um, a lot of the best socializing at parties is often ones where everyone's standing and walking around and milling and moving from conversation to conversation is 
that motion actually helps us process our emotions. And so it's easier to stay in a relaxed, calm, and confident state while we can walk and move versus when we tend to sit at a table in a more formal setting, we are restricting our movement more and that anxiety builds up. And that does not conducive to jovial, fun atmospheres that we all want when we play. Because even when we're just talking with our friends, that's still technically play. It is a give and take. It is conversation is a give and take with, you know, uh, I forget what you call it, ad hoc established norms, um, which is why people look at you weird when you suddenly bring up a type of conversation that has not been previously acceptable here. And then like, wait, what, what? That's too serious. You know, if they, you see that like, cause you've broken some ad, some social norms that have been established previously. Like, so that's mm -hmm. what I say, like even conversation is play. Mm -hmm. It's still a give and take back and forth. And especially if you're neurodivergent, it's not always easy to pick up on those notes, but also it's sometimes hard to give those um, nonverbal cues to others. And so it you become more self-conscious when you converse and when you're trying to just participate. And so we wanted to go over some of these little tips and tricks we've picked up as well um, of how to make it easier both sides. Because we're human, we are social creatures. If you are antisocial, it is probably because your social experiences have been poor and you're like, I'd rather stay away than have more negative experiences because humans love positive social experiences. We love hanging out with other people who like seeing us. I love playing board games, even if I'm losing, with friends. A good set of friends, it doesn't really matter who's winning. It's just a game. Mm -hmm. Poor set of friends, it matters a lot who's winning. And that's some toxic situation you'd find a way out of. That's where we hear those horror stories about, um, I forget what you call them, uh, team building exercises at work is where they try to do these pro-social um, games with people who are just required to be there. They don't actually have an instinct or want necessarily to be friends with each other. And that's what they're trying to force. And suddenly this it doesn't work. So... Yeah, like, but we all, we're human. We all need to know we're part of a group and we're safe with them. And that's what play establishes. You are safe here. If someone's coming up behind you, the person you're talking to is going to tell you. Unless they feel that you are safe with whatever's coming up behind you. But yeah, like, that's also where we're like, we get the, those questions about, you know, establishing boundaries. And teenagers and these behaviors, um, the reckless behaviors especially, is where they're trying to understand how do you create a boundary? What is okay to do and what's not okay to do? So the, yeah, they will do stuff that's definitely not okay. And then the job of the group is to go, that's not okay. Or that's great, let's you know do that again, but next time to this person. And that's how we figure out these little play norms. So Glory, shall we first start in a way that I feel fewer people will feel called out and talk about how it works with kids since you've had the most experience with that. <clears throat> how does play work with children? Yeah. What are you looking for to see effective play? Like as um, an educator. Okay. What I'm looking for is for the children involved in the play to overall have um, more relaxed physical body language stance whether they're sitting or standing, that they don't look tense or uptight, but they look, you know, essentially casual, standing, casual, seated. But um, I'm looking for that. I'm looking for relatively relaxed facial expressions um, rather than tenseness or sometimes children will take. I don't know how to explain it until you've seen it, but it's sort of a grotesque facial expression. So if it's happy, it's like rictus. If it's angry, it's it's very exaggerated. So I'm, I'm definitely looking to make sure I don't see that. Mm -hmm. If I do see that, um, I'm going to look to immediately um, 
either sort of get involved and see if their facial expressions change or if they don't, I'm definitely going to see often if that's happening, it's only one child that has sort of this grotesque facial expression and the other one is more confused or just slightly turning away and kind of ignoring the child. So the one with the unusual facial expressions, I'm going to try to set, pull aside and say, how's it going? What's going on? And often it turns out maybe they need to go to the bathroom. Maybe um, the other child maybe was handling bugs and that the other and the so the child I'm talking to was taught bugs are bad. Don't ever touch them. And so the that kid doesn't know how to process that other children handling bugs is not a crime against humanity. Because hmm. their brains are little and so they're trying to figure out how to process this stuff. Yeah, they haven't had enough experience to kind of figure out what what are the rules they need to figure out to make it okay or not okay. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's because it sounds kind of what you're really describing is what in adults we now call masking. Yes. Of where they are keeping a ex, an acceptable expression, they think, on their face. They think, but it's not. It's not. No, it's not. Um, while they try to process what's going on here and how should they be about this. So, like, and so that's been my experience, like, either the unusual facial expressions is because some child has committed a crime against humanity, according to another child, like, maybe they peed in their pants, or even pooped in their pants, and, and, you know, and, or the other child has witnessed somebody didn't go potty in the potty, and they don't know, like, should I go get an adult, Should I leave and go somewhere else? They don't know what to do. And they, they, uh, the little brain is just error codes. And, um, so, but as long as both, like all the children involved in play, uh, their bodies are rather casual and relaxed, then no matter what they're doing, I'm going to try my best to leave them alone. Um, because they need to, hello, Eva, they need to definitely work it out, whatever's going on. So even if one child has committed a crime against humanity, like touching a caterpillar, that the other child is like, oh my God, you can't touch him. Mommy said you cannot touch him. As long as they are talking it out, where the other kid's like, no, it's totally fine. My mom says it's fine to touch caterpillars. At least this particular kind of caterpillar is safe. I can't touch all caterpillars. Like, as long as they're still conversing, mm-hmm. that's okay. Even if they're having a disagreement, that is totally fine. It's when I see essentially body or facial expressions that say error code, error code, cannot compute, um, or distress. Then, But as long as I'm not seeing distress of any kind, they're just often like part of play. Uh, what I'll, I've noticed many adults don't understand to play with younger children like we're talking toddlers so under six um under five at least if they're sitting next to each other playing with their own toys but they're still sitting like within arm's reach of each other or approximately that is still play even if they're just playing side by side and they're not interacting or necessarily even talking to each other that is actually still considered play and that is a valid form of play because they're learning to play cooperatively in the sense that they're not disturbing each other's play. They're not interrupting in a negative way each other's play. That is still a valid form of play. And they're playing quietly together. That is actually a wonderful form of play because it's sort of a meditative type. And what I've noticed is I tend to see parents interrupt that type of play. So that when the children are older, they don't know how to quietly play together. They only know how to rambunctiously play together. And um, it's if I could have parents in particular, and also, frankly, some undereducated teachers, know one thing, it would be to just allow children to quietly play together side by side without directly interacting with each other. Mm-hmm. So they learn how to do that. So think about, like, what is that when people get a little older, that's people studying together at the same table, but not talking. They're quietly studying. That is a more, um, 
mature version of the same kind of play. Uh, that is two people in an office space using a certain amount of shared space and not interrupting each other's work. Again, a problem I have had with working with adults in my life is please stop coming to constantly interrupt me. I cannot get Jack done. And it's because they do not know how to cooperatively, quietly play together. They only know how to rambunctiously interact. And there's nothing wrong with rambunctiously interacting. But you need all the skill sets. And versus, I do know some children who did not know how to inter and rambunctiously interact. They only know how to quietly play. <clears throat> Those tended to be older parents who definitely seem to appreciate the quiet, which I, look, I do too also enjoy the quiet, but I do think children should be allowed to get noisy uh, within certain spaces. Like say a playground is a wonderful space to get noisy. And excited. Um, outdoors in a backyard, again, should be another place that is perfectly valid to get noisy, at least say when the sun is out. It's like one thing to say, well, when the sun goes to sleep, we need to quiet down. Versus when the sun is up and we can see the sun, then it's okay to be loud and noisy because the sun is awake. Yes. Our, he says our entire house is noisy. My child plays that way with kids at the library most times. There's one that has been there so often at the same time they'll talk and engage more. But typically it's just him and another nearby. Exactly. So, um, like, I think it's kind of interesting that you see people parents and also teachers wanting children to replicate only the kinds of play that adult grew up with as a child rather than as long as nobody is like hurting another child against their consent versus if they're playing wrestling that's consenting they're both agreeing they're playing or all of however many are playing wrestling. So they're going to like fake body slam each other. But as long as they understand only fake body slam on the couch, not on the floor, you know, because you don't want to actually hurt anybody. Like, that's fine. I know back when I was in, when I was in elementary school and upper elementary, mm -hmm. um, wrestling was a big thing at the time. Oh, yes. I remember. And I, rem I remember after a few months, because um, I had a group of friends, we would all play. We tended to, we weren't all in the same classroom, but they all tended to go at the same time for recess. Yeah. And we would all kind of play wrestle and practice wrestle, you know, stuff we'd seen. Mm -hmm. And we did it in a off, you know, off the main playground area. And I remember eventually after a few months, several kids complained to their teachers of, hey, those kids are roughhousing. Mm -hmm. How come they can do it and we can't? And, you know, lucky for us. The teachers went back to them and went, because they know how to play, they know how to, they're play wrestling. They've shown us what they're doing mm -hmm. and they make sure to stay safe. No one ever gets hurt. No one ever gets, you know, more than they are feeling that they get upset or anything. That's why they can. Because we've watched them. Yeah. And everyone's cooperating. And they know how to rambunctiously play together in a safe way. And no one's being hurt. bullied. Mm -hmm. anyone wants to stop they stop right and they can just walk away and nobody's like insisting they come back um so that's what i'm looking for uh in play with that you know of children exhibiting play um i think eva brings up an interesting point that i definitely we're both clicking things that we um i do want to bring up so eva says i grew up hearing it's not my job to entertain you so i've just been doing what i wanted rather than what i got it's exhausting. I get it, Mom. I get it. So I would like to point out that, again, intergenerational play is also a valid form of play. And all children should get to practice intergenerational play. So what that means is playing both cooperatively, like next to, say, an adult who is doing. So, like, you've seen this. You've probably seen this before where, like, an adult is doing something on a desk whether with a laptop or with paper or even reading and highlighting something. And the child is sitting next to the adult or somewhere on the same table 
coloring or doing something quietly by themselves, but they are doing it together in the same space. And that is a valid form of intergenerational play. And it's really a necessary part of play practice for children uh, is to how to play with people of various ages in a way that is fully consenting for everyone. Also, another form of intergenerational play is where the two or more people of greatly different ages, like any time, I think what, like in psychology, I think it's if it's more than a five-year age difference, it's considered intergenerational, even though we know full well a generation is more like 18 to 20 years. But they're just talking about where they're developmentally at a very different stages. But also like a child with an adult who are interacting with each other. So like what my mother used to do when I was a little toddler was we used to play grocery store together where I was the cashier and she was the shopper. And I would ring up her things, her items, and, you know, bag them up and also need to make small talk with her at the same time. Um, <laughs> best, best audio recordings ever. Yeah, it is adorable. Tom has heard it. We didn't have a video camera back then. It was the early 80s. So mom and dad used a, a, a tape recorder. And there I am at like, what? two and a half is I think it was before you were born uh it might have been we have a couple of recordings grocery store was my favorite intergenerational play um but we also sometimes played restaurant but like where mom or dad or both were the restaurant goers and I was the wait staff and the chef I I love store you get Isaac on a backstage live stream and he and I can play grocery store together. Um, I still, as an adult, I love grocery store. He doesn't really get it though. It is really opted on including public air. It's more so now, but he's new to it. Yeah. I would definitely recommend taking him at least a couple times a year to the grocery store so he can observe how the adult world interacts and then he can mimic it at home because that's actually a very important part of play is mimicking what we see in the adult world. So you're going to see this also. Adults still do this. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about myself. So I have a game on my phone that I play daily called My Hot Pot Story. It's a, it's a game app thing. And in it, you, the player, are running a Chinese, like in, in mainland China restaurant, apparently, a hot pot restaurant. And as you go in the game, you open up new sections of the restaurant. So you have like first your main section and then you have your VIP rooms. And then eventually you have your theater room, which is so cool. I love this. And then um, also at the same time, your chefs are developing new recipes. So you're also developing new hot pot broths and new things to put in the hot pot. And it includes, it, it breaks it down by, you don't put the drinks in the hot pot, but like things you would have with your hot pot order. So various drinks, side dishes, fish, meat, and vegetables. And also sauces. And I feel like I'm learning a lot about Chinese hot pot cuisine. Because uh, there's very informative descriptions of the foods and what they taste like and the broths and what's in them. It's very interesting. And everything I've Googled uh, has totally like been exactly that. It's been very interesting to learn about this. But that is a form of play that both children and ad we see adults still enjoy. So it's like the hot pot restaurant is a real thing in human life. I personally have not been to one. The nearest one is like opened up, um, I think last year or the year before, about an hour and a half away from us. So we could go. It actually does hot pot and grilled meats. It looks kind of interesting. It's a little expensive. Um, and also it's a bit of a drive. So that would be like at least three hours round trip for us to go. So we'll probably go one day because I've now seen several of my friends on Facebook and Instagram go. And they've taken pictures of the menu and the grill and the, all that. So it is interesting. But... That is a real thing in the world that also I am playing pretend at. 
And that is a valid part of play because it's sort of part of what it does is it allows you to live this other life in someone else's shoes while also getting more familiar with how particular things are done in a part of like another interaction, such as this kind of restaurant. Hot pot restaurants are not the norm here in America. And that I have never really been to one. So it's not common mm. here, although it probably will become more and more common. And so things are done a little differently because they bring you your broth. It heats up there. It's already kind of warm, but then it heats up uh, at the table. The table has a heater. And then you have raw ingredients on various little plates. And you keep putting more in the hot pot and then pulling it out for your little plate or bowl. That's a very different cultural kind of way to have a meal than how we traditionally have it here in America. And like that is why it's important for children to see how, observe how things are done in the real world, such as at a diner or restaurant, and then play restaurant at home as they sort of navigate and figure out what are all the parts to make this feel like a restaurant experience. And then different restaurant experiences, such as a diner is different from like a French haute couture or, or haute cuisine kind of restaurant is a very different, let alone a fast food restaurant. Like there's each of these restaurants have somewhat different ideas of decorum, different ideas of acceptable dress, different ideas of how the menu is even set up. There's a lot to navigate. And it's very important for children to get that interaction. Yes, hot pot is so good. It's important for children to get that interaction, but quite honestly, it's also important for adults too. I have regrettably <laughs> seen more than a few times, like Tom and I, there's a local Indian restaurant. It's wonderful. We have been at this restaurant so many times in the last, what, eight, 10 years-ish? Where someone is coming for the first time and they're brought by like a couple people who are already familiar with this restaurant and to overhear the conversations are wild. Because the adults, often they are an older person who has never been to an Indian restaurant before and they have not like looked ahead of time at the menu online. And they are very uncomfortable with how different the menu appears and all these things they're unfamiliar with on the menu to what they are usually used to. I'll say it, Cracker Barrel. And like, we just, oh my God, we'll just sit there like trying <laughs> to not look at each other. Because if Tom and I look at each other, we'll laugh. And we don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable. But some of the things that come out of people's mouths the first time they go to this Indian restaurant is mwah, hilarious. Um, well, where's the chicken nuggets like that, that kind of stuff. I just, I can't find chicken nuggets anywhere on this menu. Where am I missing it? I see fish nuggets. Like, I no, see goat. <laughs> yes, I see goat. I didn't even know anybody still ate goat. My granny ate goat. Anyway, like that kind of like, oh my God, the Beverly Hills are come. It's, it would just sit there just enjoying our meal and loving the conversation that we hear. I don't want it too spicy. Or, oh, I want it real spicy. They're like, are you sure, Dad? Are you sure you want it real spicy? Because they do it real spicy. Is it real, real spicy? Like, yeah, it is. Like, you want it medium spicy here is real spicy to us. Like, oh, okay. Like, these kind of, because again, culturally, there is differences even in the spiciness level <clears throat> on the menu. You see, this is important to children because the whole world is new to them. But it's also, frankly, important to adults. Because even restaurant culture is different than maybe, say, what they're already used to. And so what people will do if they don't know is they'll just shut down. Mm -hmm. They will not oh, say anything. We literally they see people at this restaurant just get up and walk out and drive away in their SUV. And leave the other restaurant goers at their table just, well, that didn't work. This is why we obsessively study many before we go to a new restaurant. Just saying, hi, welcome to being neurodivergent. It actually makes you more functional at various things. Yeah, because neurodivergent, we assume we probably don't know what we're going into. And so we need as much prep as we can get. Versus neurotypical, there's used to everyone else being on the same page they are, that 
they can usually glide through a lot of situations that would stress a neurodivergent person out. Mm -hmm. But when they reach a, a novel situation, such as going to a restaurant of a food and a um, norms type that they have never experienced, you will see the same behaviors. Yep. Except they don't have all these little backup plans. Mm -hmm. Neurodivergents have developed throughout their entire lives of how to cope. Yep. And they, but they freak out just as much, if not more. Yep. Because so like the human. first time I go to any restaurant, like if I've never been to that particular restaurant before, I'm going to know, I'm going to go see if I can find the menu online. Usually now the internet has been wonderful. Somebody's posted online and I will like know what I'm planning to order. And I will know what I have backup plan to order in case that stuff is out. Uh, and I'll have some ideas of potential other things I'm interested in just in case a bunch of things are out. Cause you never know. Yeah, it's like, yes, practice ordering. Mm -hmm, amen. Or telling no to order for me because we're here and it's his fault usually. Yeah, mood. Um, like, oh, believe me, I've already gone through the hot pot restaurant menu that's 90 minutes away. I have already decided the first time I will go, we will get the family meal. So I don't have to make decisions about which things to order a la carte. I can just have it as a set and then explore it from there. So that the next time I go, maybe I'll order a la carte or maybe we'll just really like the like set menu because they have a menu for one and a menu for two. And then they have a menu for four people. And we'll do that. Like, oh, I already like it's going to be months, if not maybe even a year before we go. I already have it planned out. But again, that is a coping mechanism. It's really good for kids. I It, it makes me sad that more people particularly when they're going to a restaurant or something with a child that they do not show the menu to the child ahead of time. So the child can go ahead and like start looking at the menu and figuring out what they want to order before they get to the restaurant of like the world is entirely new to a child. Give them some time. <laughs> but also, and like, this is like why play is a great opportunity of mm -hmm. you can play with your kid, you know, play, we're going to fast food. We're going to fast casual. You know, mm -hmm. we're going to semi-formal mm -hmm. restaurant and the, how do you act there? Let's, you know, let's prep, you know, let's play. How would you do this? And, you know, that way you can practice and see like what's, so the kid also can see like when they do these behaviors, what's the negative responses they could get as well. Mm -hmm. But in a way that they feel safe and comfortable in, like that's, that's really also what people are often doing at parties. Yep is we are playing at being the kind of people we want to be and seeing what people's reaction to that is. People and is at, it... at parties often play with certain kinds of stories that they tell. They'll tell uh, the same story multiple times at the same party. Um, or they'll play at sort of a twist on their own personality to see what people think. Like, now I'm a fedora-wearing guy or whatever. Or now I have brought a guitar. I'm a guitar playing person. Like, and they'll see, and if that doesn't go well, you'll see they don't necessarily bring it the next time. Or they're like, okay, I have a new way to introduce the guitar. Mm -hmm. Only the guitar is just never, no. But. To say like, no to the guitar unless you are paid to come there with a guitar. Or, like, if you're really, really, really good, maybe, but. Mm. And trying to drum up business to tutor. Right. Yeah, something. That says that is the way to go with stuff like that. Hot pot, Korean barbecue, hibachi, go with the family plan as much as possible. Yes, exactly. Uh, I'm always relieved when they have a family plan. Haven't eaten inside an establishment other than a hotel room since 2019. Pretends he's all he's going to get. <laughs> but I mean, I've seen videos of like various parents setting up their house as a certain type of restaurant. And the kids come and sit at the table and then they're given actual menus to then order. Granted, the menus are very limited <laughs> like because the parent has already prepared the food. But again, so that they so kids have a time to practice how to behave at a restaurant and what they can expect. Like some restaurants are so fancy, the waiter will actually drape the napkin in your lap for you. If you are not expecting this, this might be surprising. 
and not necessarily an enjoyable experience if suddenly like what what is happening here no. so these are important things to practice that and that is what play really is is practice in a fun way so again um intergenerational play is very important because the vast majority of us are going to be interacting with people both younger and older than us our entire lives it's just going to happen like why have i gotten older but all of my medical practitioners keep getting younger when i started in the world as a young person all the doctors were like in their late 50s and early 60s and as i have been progressing through the march of time all of my medical practitioners are getting younger and younger and i am waiting for them to to wear diapers and come with pacifiers like what is happening why is this my life but this is my life and it is important for people to learn how to interact with people both younger same age and older and the only way that's going to happen is with more play with more interaction where it's low stakes see that's the thing about play it's low stakes all right what if this particular play does not end up being that enjoyable or last that long no big deal it's low stakes there wasn't much on the line we're not going to try that again probably that is why versus real life like let's say i go to the clinic that's high stakes mm -hmm. that's high stakes things could go real bad real fast I have had doctors yell at me and I have gotten up and walked out because no, you don't talk to me that way. I'm a real human being and I don't know what's wrong with you. But like going to the office manager and saying, I would like to file a complaint right now. I did not literally pay to come here and be actually yelled at because I asked simple, important medical questions I have asked about a hundred times in the past. And like, but that's high stakes. I know, however, to stand up for myself and my boundaries and then who to go to, the office manager, because I have had low stakes interactions, again, with other people who were more skilled at going to clinics or using clinic facilities. And when I, they're like, well, give me your worst case, your greatest fear of what will happen. And I, we have played, we have role played this out. And then I'm like, I don't know what to do at the point that like somebody's treating me bad in a, in a clinic room. And like this, the other people are like, oh, no, 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 you do this, this, and this. And I'm like, do I? Is that an option that I did not know? There was a time in my life where I did not know you can go to the office manager and go, I need a form to fill out a complaint. And, but that is very much what happens at, you know, both play dates for kids, but also, mm -hmm. you know, as adults, you know, the equivalent adult play dates of where we go out to eat or we go do, we go play together, we go visit is we'll do this as well as when you go to parties is you know you will tell this story and you'll try right. your best to tell it in a humorous or a, a scary way and then you see the audience's responses but since it's so interactive and close one-on-one -on -one, often that's where you gain this little extra data of how would other people handle this situation whether mm -hmm. it's you know high stakes in a doctor's office with a mechanic Mm -hmm. out in the woods in the middle of the night and you have no cell coverage um how about meeting with a realtor to look at houses <clears throat> these are important real life how about going to a car place to purchase a car like these are all real human action interactions that like it's not unheard of that you might experience that at some point in your life Maybe you never will. Maybe you will only ever buy used cars. In which case, let's go buy a used car. My mother used to do this when I was a child. She did. She literally. That was actually one of our mother's favorite ones. Our father looked at her like she was a little weird. <laughs> She's driving in the car, right? We're in the back seat. She's like, okay, let's play pretend. Like, okay, what are we pretending? And she's like, we're going to go buy a used car. Okay how do we start playing this she's like well first you have to find a used car to go contact someone okay and just for the record this was the late 80s early 90s so it's like well how do i find a used car and she's like well you could drive around and if you see a car with a phone number like painted on it but also you could go open the newspaper so pretend you're opening the newspaper like okay opening the newspaper where she's literally looking through the rear view or the back mirror 
to make sure we're fully pretending. Find your classified ad. And y'all, this is true. I The first time she tried to pull this on me, I probably was like, what, seven or eight? And mm -hmm. I was like, I don't know what a classified ad about a car looks like. She literally went and found a newspaper dispensing, you know, vending machine, got a newspaper out. She'd obviously parked the car, got the newspaper. You know, it was a quarter back then. So long ago, pull it out. Of the this is what classifies look like. Oh, oh, is that what they're called? I always wonder. I just thought they were like the boring pages. And that is literally what I used to call them. The boring pages. Cause there's no pictures in the classifieds. And she showed me the auto section and although it's not cars, like, no, She's like, oh, find one, find one. Like, and I was not a good reader at the time. I was not a strong reader. I was mostly illiterate. And so like, she, I was like, you find one and you read it to me. Okay. And then she's like, she read it out loud. I'm like, ah, oh, that's, I don't want that car. I don't like trucks. I want a nice car. Find me a good car. She found, <laughs> I was always a little late. And she found one. I was like, okay, I would like that. A green car. I will take a green car. And she's like, what do you do? I was like, uh, I guess we have to go to the car. So I think we were going to the grocery store or something. So she gets back in the car uh, to go continue. Or maybe maybe this was, that was where she got the vending machine, uh, the vending thing. So we're going, well, I think we were walking through the grocery store, just grocery shopping. And she's like, okay, pretend I am the owner of the green car. Hello, I hear that you are interested in my car. Yes. Could you, how do I buy your car? <laughs> And so she's coaching me through this and everything. It was incredibly awkward, but she, I think she was tickled about this. She's like, Oh, well, it's a lovely car. And I was like, well, it sounds good. She's like, well, we haven't driven it. You have to drive it. Like, oh, do I? But I don't know how to drive. You know how to drive for this game. You know how to do I? She's like, yes, behold my car. She's pointing at the shopping cart. It is a lovely green car. <sighs> is it? Are you sure there's not like Cheerios in the back seat? <laughs> on the floor oh well i'll get that vacuumed you know <laughs> and again we're interacting this is it this is literally the game it's an improv game there's no right or wrong you just kind of go with it and she's like oh well i want this much i'm like i literally do not have that much money mommy <laughs> and she's like how much you got and i was like opening up my little coin purse that i always brought to the grocery store i was like I have 27 cents and three buttons. She's like, well, you can make a down payment to me. What is a down payment, mommy? That's where you pay a little now and then you pay me every month. Oh, well, I can pay you, ma'am. I can pay you a button a month. Oh, I like that deal. I will accept your deal. <laughs> but I mean, it does make it very low stakes. Yeah, because, like, I mean, I don't know how to play this game. She's having to teach me as we go. So then the next time uh, we were in the car, it was probably a couple weeks later, it was like, Mommy, I have a car to sell. Would you be interested in buying my car? She's like, tell me about your car. It is it is a lovely car. It is pink with purple stripes. I just got it. She is gorgeous, but I have too many cars. Would you like to test drive it? She's like, oh, do I? It, it's... What kind is an automatic or standard? I don't know what that is, mommy. And having to explain all the parts. But again, this is part of the play. Is this game. And it's mostly just a verbal game. Although you can make it a more physical game. It taught me a lot about interacting with people. Particularly, mom would always pretend to be a stranger. Like, oh, I don't know who you are, ma'am. I don't know if I can trust you. Like, well, I'm trying to be trustworthy, mommy. I guess you would just have to know me longer. We could go out to lunch after this. <laughs> but that's part of the game. Is It's an intergenerational game. And, and you never know what's going to come out of anybody's mouth. I mean, yeah, it is the best. It is one of the best ways to learn because even if there is a misstep, there is none of that negative feeling as much in your brain because like when there are times really where mom built, refused to sell me her car yes there were she was like no i don't like your deal i'm so sorry unacceptable no but doing that though gives it a 
when people feel shame and guilt, their thinking shuts down a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to learn or practice when you feel guilt or shame. And so that is the other problem with these high stakes situations, having to learn as you go. Because mm -hmm. the second you make a misstep in a high step situ high stakes situation, your brain starts to shut down, you get dumber. That's bad. Yeah. But versus when you're playing, you make a misstep, you're fine. How do we re how do I recover? How do I how do I get back to where I was enjoying playing this and doing this? Our parents had an electric typewriter. Uh, more than a few times, they had us make up fake menus for various holiday meals. Like, so we had to first draw, we had to write it up in by hand on lined paper. And then we would go and print out one menu on the electric typewriter, like for Thanksgiving or Christmas. And then, you know, mom was like, well, make it look pretty. All menus look nice. Get your colored pencils out. And, and so that's exactly what I would then do. And like then my parents would ooh and ah over it at Thanksgiving. Of ooh, look at the very fun menu Gloria made. Oh, very nice. Oh, we'll have to mail it to my mother. You know, that's, they would mail most of these things to Grandma Marty. Um, <laughs> Which I now look at, look back on. I thought this was really silly and odd growing up. Like, why, but now why I was like, care? but as an adult, you know what? I actually like seeing these from kids. Yeah. I find them fascinating to see what their interpretation is of this mm -hmm. oh yeah like i would put like a black border like because you know a lot of menus are um that sort of the like is you know as eva says the long narrow leatherish covering uh they often have that or used to have in the 80s that black border um uh and was an insert and so, like, I'd paint the edges all black. Um, not necessarily straight, but it was fine. Um, and everything so it would look like that. And always have, like, a little curly cue or something at the top, the middle. Make it look nice. It is fun to practice these things. And then when I grew up, there you'd be surprised how many times it was like, oh, we need a menu. Go print one up really quick, Lori. And versus everyone else at the office has never made a menu in their entire life. And I'm like, what the hell, the hell have you lived? But maybe their parents didn't know to practice playing all of these kind of experiences. And, and then there's, then you get older and then we're at these social gatherings and we're doing the same thing. We're practicing, we're playing at parties. And at least if you're neuro, I feel like this is one of those small hints, you're neurodivergent long before you realize you're neurodivergent. If when you were a teenager in 20 something, if before you'd go to a party, if you would do your best to have a friend of yours with you and you would practice your stories and your lines for various situations, whether it was a pretty person you wanted to get to know better and maybe take out on a date, or if you wanted to get, or a story you wanted to tell in a group setting, that you would practice this with a friend from your body language to the way you start to your facial expressions. There's a clue you may be neurodivergent. <laughs> Because most neurodivergent people I know, looking back and now look back and go, oh yeah, they were also neurodivergent, would all also do this little trick of before you go to the party, what are the stories you want to come loaded with? And mm -hmm. what are the expressions and looks you want to have? And you know, what do you think would actually work on someone you're attracted to? And let's look in the mirror first before we do this at a party, because sometimes your face does not agree or your body or your body movements and body language does not agree with your thoughts. And you're yeah, sending the, the wrong message. 
standing in front of a full length mirror in your party clothes while your friend critiques your body language. Mm -hmm. As you go, oh, really? Ha, 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 ha. Oh, that's very interesting. Like, and that's all you're saying is, yeah, that's very interesting. Hmm. No, I've never thought. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. Not, not this. Do this. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I've never They'll thought. They'll say which parts you look cuter or more manly or, you know, or what? Or what? Or no, this, look this will make you look older. Because, like, when I was a teenager... All the teenage girls who obsessed with making you look older. Oh, yes. oh do you remember the terrible make you look liners? mature? Brown lip liner. May it never come back. I saw that it's coming back right now. I saw a TikToker. I do not miss the 90s makeup. But yeah, of like how to make you look older when in fact all it did was make us look haggard. Anyway, that was a whole nother. Brown lipstick, y'all. Like actual just brown. Like the color of turds. Mm-hmm. They're, mm. The best we could hope for was chocolate, but mm, in, in, We rarely. thought it made us look older. Mm. I remember... I remember my mother would not let me wear such dark makeup. So I had to wear the more pinkish browns. And then, but my friend may or may not have been a girlfriend. I don't know. The jury's still out on that. Um, she was wearing like the color of turds on her lips. And it, it was strange looking. It was sort of like, like charmed. But like the TJ Maxx version of Charmed. You know, the dress barn version of Charmed. <laughs> I have achieved a point. Tom has literally mm. face palmed. I win. That is a burn right there. That's called a fire department. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. <sighs> yep. The yep. dress barn version of Charmed. Ooh. It was. That is exactly, yep. All right, so mm -hmm. let's take a break. Everyone can, you know, get some of your drink, see if maybe, you know, check on your body. Does it need to go visit facilities? Maybe get a snacky snack. And when we come back, let's <laughs> talk about some actual games we like playing with others. Sound good? Sure. And we can tell some humorous slash horror stories of playing these games. All right. Well, good luck. See you in a little bit.
Welcome, welcome. Hello again. <clears throat> I know, it's like I just came back. Like I just saw you so, two minutes ago. Yeah. So something I heard recently, um, I was watching, what, what, what was it? Uh, I think it was Jan Janelle Monet on Seth Meyers like a week or two ago and she was talking about you know the latest uh glass onion or whatever it was movie sure let's call it that i'm sure no. and well there's definitely no love lost between me and ryan johnson and a few of his other movies mm. you know by all accounts everyone really likes these mystery movies he's been doing you know this one and the previous one knives out and but to give you a sense of how much does Ryan Johnson love a murder mystery? During the filming, he organized and put on a wholly original murder mystery dinner for the main cast to also play out and have fun doing. As a you know, as a break from the main filming. Now be these other characters, and do it, like that's how much Ryan Johnson loves this. So, like he just wrote it during the you know during the beginning of filming, and then they all played the game of this murder mystery. That's how much he loves it. But they all had I fun love, too. I love murder mystery dinners. Like y'all are all lucky that you live too far away to come to my murder mystery dinner party. I love people playing characters. I love there being a body who is also eating dinner. <coughs> it was I love the whole Did I, in fact, look up yesterday how many dinner murder mystery dinner theaters are there in Pigeon Forge? Yes. And then look up what the menus are. Yes, I sure did. I mean, because it's fun to play with others. And since you're playing characters, there's even less judgment on your behavior from others because you can truly just play this character. You don't have to worry about people judging who you are. They are judging who this character is. Mm -hmm. so you can truly just have fun. And, you know, but, and, but that was essentially Janelle Monet's thing of like, no, this... The dinner party was really fun. I will go to other movies with Ryan just to do more of these mm -hmm. dinner theater, you know, games. Mm -hmm. They're just, you know, fun to do. Of like, and that is how much play helps. Of like, there's no stakes. It's just fun. The stakes are: can you keep the fun going for everyone? Mm -hmm. And so that's also what I want to talk about: is you know, the fun and the. In the, in the horrifying games we played together and what led to these different situations. Um, what you doing, Oops, Gloria? Sorry. I don't know. I'm doing things. You're doing a lot of weird things. I am doing weird things. Hold up. Sorry. Um, and like, there's a lot of, because there's a lot of games we have played with our friends over the years. Um, from tabletop role-playing games, you know, namely D&D, uh, two board games. Um, definitely one of the ones that stand out oddly is I had a friend, one of Gloria's girlfriends, um, whose uncle, I don't remember what what it was he had, but he definitely had some processing problems where oh, yes. in a different life he would have had to live in a state school, but his family kept him, took care of him. He was fine. He could take care of himself. Um, but just, you know, he was slower developing, but he loved playing the board game life in part because he was really good at it. 
could not find a way he was cheating. He just knew how to play this game. Yep. And so, like, that was always the warning <clears throat> our friend would give any new people is, you're probably not going to win. My uncle will probably win. That's He just enjoys playing this game a lot, but he will ask if you want to play. If you can play with him, he loves just everyone to play mm -hmm. with him. But don't play if you're not okay losing. Yeah. And so, you know, we went in knowing this and we had a fun time. I mean, he was a good sport. He was fun to play with. Never had any problems you know, playing board games he with He wasn't him. annoying about winning. Yeah. Even at that point, he'd been playing that game like 55 years. Every so, version there he, ever was. He knew all the facts. Mm hmm. And, you know, which versions, which was best to play, because, you know, he just mm -hmm. he played it a lot. Yep. But we all had fun playing, and pretty much um, when we were stamped there every night, we'd all play a game at least once. Yeah, because he liked to play it every single night. Like, he'd want to play it all night if he could, but pretty much, like, he would be okay with playing at least once a night. Yeah, or once a day, like, on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, so we'd, we'd go ahead and get that done before watching the mo whatever movie we wanted to watch. Um and this was fun. We all had fun playing. It was not a a major obligation, other than we knew it would make his day brighter, mm -hmm. and he would be a more cheerful person. And so our lives would be more cheerful because he would be cheerful. Yeah. So yeah, why not? It doesn't take that much time. Besides, it was either that or watch an Ernest movie. Yeah. Because he really one of the lesser known movie. Ernest movies. Yeah, he had the entire collection of every Ernest everything ever on VHS. Um, and yes, he did have the Ernest hunting safety video on VHS. He showed it to me once. Uh, yeah. So it's like I'd rather play a game of life than watch an Ernest movie. And, but also another good part that I did appreciate about playing the game with him is it also clued me in on how to talk with him because I mean he definitely like he had profound processing mental processing issues that meant that there were definitely best ways to communicate in ways that just he he would not hear or notice and it could be hard to talk with him <laughs> but, you know, there's only a certain set of interactions you're really going to have playing a game like life. And you start to pick up on what he responds best to and what he didn't really respond to. And so it also kind of gave you a time, it gave you understanding of what's a good way to talk with him in general. And so that's the other part I liked about playing with him was it kind of gave me practice talking with him and how to essentially befriend him. Um, because, you know, I just really wasn't sure. I hadn't really dealt with people like her uncle before. So I didn't have any, any background knowledge to rely on. So I was figuring it out as I went. And you just never even know what kind of questions to ask your friend when someone's not around of how do I handle this in the future? So yeah, playing these games kind of help ease this way in understanding and learning. I think it also helped you to see me playing with him at the same time. Because I had worked with you know, kids in special ed mm -hmm. uh, before I had this was after I had my teaching degree. So, hello Nora. Um, so I had already worked with, I'd never been, you know, working with somebody this much older than school age. Mm -hmm. Um, because he was like literally old enough to be my father. <clears throat> and yeah, so that he actually, was he actually outlived the life expectancy. Mm -hmm. Every doctor he'd had growing up had ever given him. And that's very much a full credit to his mother and his, his sister. Yeah. But like, 
I knew how to have conversations with those who have developmental delays and other things just because I had worked with them in the past. I'd seen other teachers model the behavior. I knew um, the kind of conversations and how to interview, essentially, how you ask leading questions so they can then essentially give you like a short essay on their opinion about something that they are very much into. Um, it was fun. I learned a lot about playing the game of life. Every time I have played the game of life since I have thought of him including when I played the Monsters, Inc. version of the Game of Life, which was wild. And I think Butchie would have had a lot of problems with the Monsters, Inc. Game of Life because they changed a bunch of the rules. Yeah. Um, which I know he was not a fan of. He has since passed away. Um, but I think it is important for people to play board games together and other tabletop games together. Uh, I think it's important for children and also, again, for intergenerational play. Because, again, it gives low stakes ways to play this. Hello. We're both clicking things. Hi. Hi. Hello. Yeah, Laura's like, speaking of board games, I'm available. <laughs> yes. How much board games have you, does your family have? <laughs> Our board we games. have, so in the garage, we have metal shelving unit things mm -hmm. on the wheels, and we have yeah. a whole I have that. row or two of That is my pantry. You're just grabbing my pantry. Yeah. And cards and dice. Yeah. Like, growing yeah. up, it was always my mother's side of the family that would play games together, and my dad's side would just sit and talk. And it's like, K -k no, <laughs> well, let's do the games. Yeah. So we roped my father into playing with us. So he hates Clue, but he'll do it. He wants to make an accusation as fast as possible and get out. <laughs> <laughs> He's also colorblind, so Uno and stuff can be a little tricky. I can see that. I can see that being a bit more hard, more yeah, difficult. Yeah, but um, it's so fun. Uh, so I I love playing games with my family. Like over Christmas, we played a Harry Potter D and D <laughs> that um, my dad does not like Harry Potter, but he played with us. Nice. My brother knows most of the movies, and he's read the first two books. And then the rest of us are all fanatics. <laughs> so, but my grandma knows nothing and she played with us too. So like, nice. it was so fun playing with my family. Like mm -hmm. my sister was the game, the, the DM. And mm. uh, I saved all of our, like we had printed out spell books based off of what year in school you were. Ah, nice. We had... Uh, our own Marauders maps that folded out. Oh, fun! <laughs> yeah, That's... and we had maps of Hogsmeade because you know mm -hmm. we were sneaking out of the castle, yo. <laughs> exactly. And uh, yeah, I saved all the backstories of my families that they had written. So um, I came up with my character first. So I was Hadrian. <laughs> and we had these scratch things. Where is it? I saved mine. Here it is. So we had these scratch cards to figure out what house you were in. Oh, nice. And so I was in Slytherin. My brother was in Slytherin. My dad was Gryffindor. My mom was Ravenclaw. My grandma was Hufflepuff. <laughs> so I was a Slytherin. I was named Hadrian. And I was a boy. And I was in fourth year my mm -hmm. brother was a slytherin in fifth year so we played brothers so i was hadrian he was badrian oh <laughs> terrible genuinely terrible it was so fun <laughs> um yeah these were the pictures that my brother and my dad drew of their characters oh no <laughs> so he was badrian and my dad was pretty kitty because that's our name for anakin skywalker <laughs> And, uh, and the hair. Yes, he had long flowing hair. Of course. Um, 
because he does not have much hair left anymore in real life. <laughs> but yeah, just coming up with all of our backstories. Like my dad, my dad's. I was abused as a child. I ran away from home at the age of two. I have great skills. Knife, torture, crossbow. My pet is a raven. It's like, <laughs> fit that into Harry Potter. Right, figure that one out. So we were all supposed to be human characters. And my grandma's like, I am a pony. <laughs> so she wrote her whole backstory as a horse. And Ravenclaw. And we all had chopsticks for wands. It's like, how does a horse hold a wand? Yeah, I was like, so she's a tiny centaur? What's happening? I don't know. <laughs> but my mom used Engorgio on her so we could all ride her to Hogsmeade. Oh, no. But we weren't out of the castle yet. So we couldn't fit through the door. Oh, no. So, like, I find that these role-playing games mm -hmm. had so much fun with my family. Like, yeah. my sister had a plot, a, a very loose little plot, like, get to Hogsmeade and back. Yeah. My brother and I got my mother expelled from Hogwarts by the end. Oh, no. <laughs> we had some great persuasion, great sleight of hand, and we pawned, and, like, we're, like, to the, the people at Hogsmeade, like, what do you have under the table? And like, we got some Felix Felicis, man. We oh, got wow. some fireworks and uh, tinker with the fireworks to be my mother's name, Belinda. Oh, no. <laughs> so, like, we had a blast. It was so fun. It took two days, but it was great. <laughs> it just, That's so like, cool. sometimes we do more in depth games like that. Sometimes we just play Farkle yeah. with, with dice. Sometime. Look, I hate I hate to admit, but I, as much as I played it as simple as it is, I still enjoy playing Phase Ten sometimes. Mm -hmm. Or we like played Harry Potter Uno. Yeah, uh, like mine and Tom's backup. Are we stuck somewhere? Nothing to do. There's got to be a deck around here somewhere. We're gonna play gin rummy. So my sister and I, when we were at Disney World, we were stuck in the long lines for the rides. Mm -hmm. And so instead of standing around staring, we pulled out my deck of cards that I got from the TV show I'd worked on. So it was an American Gods deck. And we played war. Just standing mm -hmm. in line, we played war. So mm -hmm. fun. Great memories. Yeah. But I mean, that's one of the things, like, during the break, Tom and I were talking about, Tom was like, I want to talk about D&D. &D. You know, tabletop role-playing games. And I'm like, ah, high conflict, low stakes. Because, again, these kind of tabletop, more the more in-depth role-playing, like what you're talking about with the Harry Potter role play, tabletop role-playing game, and mm -hmm. D&D is another one, but there's like a bajillion of these tabletop role-playing games. We made up our own rules and everything. Right? Is that it's high conflict. There's things potentially happening. Maybe there's a dungeon. Maybe there's a monster. You can get up to We had to room. fight a giant spider in the tunnel under the Whomping Willow. Sounds terrible. Um, but like there's gonna be a monster, there's high stakes, but it's still low, low well, I mean not high stakes, it's high conflict, it's low stakes. In real life, no one is getting hurt. Mm -hmm. In real life, in theory, everyone's gonna remain friends. Now, what I did talk about with Tom was so there are literally three people I stopped being friends with after we were playing a D&D &D game and their characters killed my character in their sleep. The audacity. And I'm like, what the hell? Now, now, in fairness, they also killed all the rest of the party's characters in their sleep. <laughs> yeah. And then raised them from the dead to do their bidding. And... So we couldn't end the game either. We had to stay for this to watch this terrible indignity, just rudeness. And I'm like, I am not friends with these people. I'm y'all. It's been 20 years. I have not repaired these relationships. I'm like, no, we're not friends. I would two of them. I would not piss on it if they were on fire. I was so mad, and I'm 20 years later. I'm still mad. <laughs> Tom knows. Tom knows. I'm genuinely still mad. I lie about it in real life when they're like, their siblings are like, you still mad at him for them? Like, no, it's fine. You know, we were all kids. 
I'm still mad. I am still upset. <laughs> like, we were there to have a good time, and you killed my character, and I had to stay there for two more hours while you did crap with my character, and you were total jerks, and we all had to watch you be total jerks. Like, I did not have fun. Yeah. And to me, that was the crime. Not that you killed my character. Like, okay, do y'all know how many times I've killed Tom's characters? And every once in a while he kills my characters. Like, it's, you know what, we're still friends. It's the fact that we we started playing this tabletop role-playing game to have fun. Mm -hmm. And they took away all the fun because I couldn't play my character anymore, but I had to stay because it was my house. And they, like, I'm not having fun. I made it very clear. Like, I thought we were come, getting together today. I cleared my schedule. I thought we were going to have fun. And then you've done this thing, and this is not fun. And they wouldn't stop doing it. So I had to sit there for two more hours of I was here to have a good time and you have taken away my good time and you won't stop this. Like, cause they could have stopped right. playing at any point and then maybe we could play a board game or something. But for two more hours, they kept up this shenanigans and the DM's like, no, you can't leave. You have to stay, which again. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I am not friends with any of those three people anymore because I, think I came there for a good time. And they specifically took away my good time. And then they were not apologetic or sorry that they ruined my good time. And then they kept this going for several more hours. And it's like, this is not what I consider friendly behavior. Right. And I still actually do not regret not being friends with them anymore. Because I'm like, how can you say we're friends if you don't care about whether I'm having a good time at this party? Yeah. Versus, yeah, good friends will change things so everyone's still having fun. Like, okay, there are various times where I've killed off Tom's characters, either as the DM or as one of the other players. And at that point, I have always been like, should we stop playing and we could play something else? And every time it's like, yeah, let's stop playing. Let's play. And we have like gotten out, again, card games. We've gotten out board games to play. I will even be the generous sibling and pick something that I know Tom wins at a lot because, so sorry about killing your character, but you did roll badly. Um... Of yeah, my... we're not playing uh what's that game? I don't know what that what's that game is, Tom. The Believe one you always win not... at. What? The one you always win at. Oh, risk. Yeah. People get mad. I've never lost a game of risk yet. Um people get real mad because they because they're like, oh no, I'm great at risk. And it's like, no, you just actually haven't been playing good strategist. Um there's a difference. <laughs> Uh, and then they're, they are poor sportsmen. And again, everybody I've ever played at risk and they've lost and they were a poor sportsman. I also was never interested in being their friends again because it's just a game. It shouldn't matter who wins this game because it's not like I was like, hey, let's play risk again. I was like, now let, I've won at risk. Let's play something else. And every time they're like, no, let's play risk again. And I'm like, okay, but, like, that's probably going to be another hour and a half, two hours of this. Are you sure you want to do this? Like, yes. I want. And then they lose again. And it's every time when they lost the second time that they then pout. And that's, it's the pouting part that it's like, I don't want to be your friend. Mm -hmm. Versus. Because you need to be, like, a good sportsman about this. We all win and lose at various games. It's a game. It's not yeah. real life or death. It's just a game. Like, yeah, versus, you do like like your mom shouldn't be mad at her kids for getting her expelled from Hogwarts. Like if anything, she's like, "Oh God, I raised these." Raised we confunded like, her. We redid the fireworks and we set the mom, and it was her name with the birds. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> like it's just meant to be fun, right? It's yeah. just fun. It was the end. Like we'd already finished the quest. It was just yeah. It's just dessert. supposed to be a good time. And again, like, I really credit, I am going to tell you, I know enough about the people that I have stopped being friends with because of how they behaved during mm -hmm. or after various games that I can honestly say they did not get a lot of opportunities to play high conflict, low stakes games as children. So they did not learn both how to be like good sportsmen about this, but also how not to be a jerk at games. Like, we never had real emotional conflict with our games. We had some physical stuff that happened. Oh, my gosh. Seems kind of emotional to have a physical conflict. I'm just going to say it, so, Laura. 
We were playing spoons. You guys ever played spoons? I don't know what you're talking about because I only know the musical instrument spoons. So you have one fewer spoons on the table than there are players. Okay. The person takes the cards and you're trying to get four of kind. Okay. And so you pick up a card, you discard it to the next person. It goes around a circle to a discard. Once somebody has four of a kind, they take a spoon. And once somebody takes a spoon, it's a free-for-all. They get the last spoon. So it's like musical chairs. Okay. And then we played it with my cousins at a rental place. They grabbed the spoon and they yoinked it and it carved the table. <laughs> I was like, oh, no! Oh, no! <laughs> so during Christmas with my grandmother, we have a few rules. We played it with plastic straws instead of metal spoons. Right. And you have to take your rings off. <laughs> so yes. Sounds like reasonable fun. rules. Yeah. But I like agree. the last the last straw was on the tip like it was the last straws. And my brother like went for it. He dove over the table and like was trying to get it for my sister. It was amazing. <laughs> it was so fun. But again, everyone's trying to have fun. Right? Yeah. They're not yeah. trying to... Like, and some of it's also for the dramatics right. of the ridiculous yeah. situation. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, yes. Hi, Bonnie. Uh, Spence says, every good story involves so me and my cousins at some point. LOL. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Me and my cousins would play Spook Alley where you turn a room or a hallway in a room into a haunted house and try and spook each other. Like, so when we were kids, our parents forbid us from playing Monopoly because Tom and I would play Monopoly for, like, weeks. Proof <laughs> to <Yes. laughs> And lessons were learned, in fact. They were. Do not let um, the football player grab a metal spoon and drag it across a wooden table. What the hell? Anyway. Um, Especially a teenager. But, yeah, like, our parents were like, you, you can't keep playing this Monopoly game you're too involved and it's like what do you mean we're having a good time because when tom and i play like okay win or lose tom and i just enjoy playing each other and we're not really caring as much who wins as much as oh what strategy do you use to win like because tom and i have known each other his entire life like this is we're in it for a long haul like this is not a sprint relationship this is a marathon. Oh no, Spence! Are you... oh, no. Who hasn't? Who doesn't have that story? <laughs> so me and my cousins started. I will start a sports fire with. And so even when we were kids, we knew like, oh, we're gonna know each other our whole lives. We can't like start a grudge now, um, because it's never gonna get resolved. We can't ever stop talking to each other because we'll keep seeing each other at family holidays. That like. We knew this already by the time like I was 10 and Tom was seven. We knew this. So, but mom and dad didn't like us playing Monopoly because they were so sure that number one, it exalts capitalism. And number two, that we were somehow too emotionally invested in this versus we just were really fascinated. We had both discussed over the summer of that particular year that we, neither of us had ever seen a Monopoly game end. And we play Lord of the Rings Monopoly. <laughs> so that has an ending. Because once so it, the ring makes it around so the it, board to Mount oh, Doom, okay. the game's over. I was like, so what? It lasts as long as the movies are longer? Anyway. Um, <laughs> the director's cut. <laughs> so I was like, Tom and I both, we'd never, in fact, we didn't know anybody who had ever actually finished Monopoly game. We'd asked every adult we do. We asked every kid in our neighborhood who'd ever played Monopoly and no one had ever finished a game. And so for the upcoming summer, we had vowed to each other, this is exactly what we're going to do. We're going to play Monopoly all summer so we finish this game. Because uh, we just wanted to know, what is it like to complete a game? So we invited our whole family to join us. But um, look, Tom and I, we are not like everyone else in our family. And eventually every other member of our family dropped out. Uh, even our little sister tried to hang on, but she just couldn't. She, after what, the first week, she's like, I'm done playing. Yeah. Because, like, we weren't playing it constantly every single day. We were playing it for, like, an hour or two each day. Mm -hmm. uh, Bonnie says, land on my hotel, I dare you. <laughs> yes. 
So I think by the third week, mom and I are like, you got to stop playing it. And we're like, no, we want it. They're like, no, you have to stop. So what do we do? So I guess what, this was when we had already lived, we already moved up to Oxford. So I was 11 and you yeah. were eight. Oh, let me tell y'all. Tom was always a sneaky little kid. I say, wasn't this, I thought this was at South 16th. No, no, that was way later. No, no, no. Was this it? was the first time we were truly sneaky little oh. sneakers. Um, so mom and dad were like, you absolutely, this is, this evening is the last game. And we're like, okay. And Tom gets the bright idea to get out of notebook paper when we finish this game, when we stop playing this game that night and just literally draw the board and draw everywhere where we were and exactly how much money we each had and where everything was. And then we would play in the middle of the night whenever he and I both had insomnia. And so for the entire rest of the summer, we had a secret game of Monopoly with like, and like, so like the first 20 minutes would be the two of us looking at his little map and setting the game board back up exactly the way it was with exactly the same bills and money for each of us. And everything had to be exactly the same. He literally had written out a list of all of um, the community cards and the other ones and which ones we had already gone through, what was in the stack, and he had rubber band them. So so it was truly this, it was a secret version of this game. And it wasn't until, what was it, two days before school started? Yeah. That Dad finally got up in the middle of the night to our clandestine Monopoly game. Like, what are you two doing? Like, we're finishing up that Monopoly game. And he's like, hold up, what? He goes pee. And he comes back, he's like, what is, what, what? Because he's very sleepy. It's like, mm, we'll just play Monopoly. He's like, is this the same game? Silence. <laughs> and he's like, how long have you been playing this? Like, all summer. <laughs> like, but your mother and I told you to stop playing. We just wanted to see how it ended. <laughs> and he's like, mm, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Like, uh huh. And I was like, we really do have to finish it. Tom's like, we are almost done. We can if we just stay up all night. So it was like probably what two in the morning. So instead of going to sleep, we stayed up till four five a.m. Like we have to finish it because they definitely are going to take this game away. And sure enough, Dad kept it in the trunk of the car for like the next five years. <laughs> Who won? Uh, I did, of course. I mean, of course. But I mean, well, but Tom literally lost by three dollars. So in <laughs> fairness, he. Barely lost to me. I felt that it was a draw because, like, we had said before earlier in the summer that true win, a true win, who which one of us wins, they would have to win by two hundred dollars. Like, you know, just winning by five dollars is really not much of a win. Or ban win. especially bankrupt the other one. Yeah, like that. We agreed it had to be a proper win, and so it was essentially for us, the two of us, it was a draw. Me right. winning by three dollars is not a win. I need to go get my dinner out of the oven. Okay. But also, like, I was... Bonnie um, says I'm still obsessed with Scrabble and Boggle. I see those in my eyes and ears perk up. That's awesome. But, like, and to give you an idea of, like, so what does it look like when kids do know how to play with each other and know, like, you know, this is just for fun? Such as Tom and me as, like, little kids playing. But, like, cause like, but I also have the opposite situation, but seeing the, the better response, which was... I mean, we had three years difference and three years for, you know, under 10 is a huge knowledge gap. Oh, yeah. and comprehension as well gap. as you were just so tired at the end. But no, 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 I'm not going there. Gloria, I'm, I'm I not gave you a 20 Monopoly. minute nap and you still just mentally, yeah, no, it was no. 4 or 5 a.m. You just, yeah, I'm not yeah. talking about Monopoly, Glory. Okay. But because I remember telling, you know, saying to Gloria, like, I don't want to play checkers anymore. Right. Because it's not fun for me. Yeah, because I mean, you know, I beat you bad every time. Yeah. Even and, when I tried to help you. And so your response was, well, then can, let me show you what the moves are. Mm -hmm. And we'll see if you can enjoy it more if you know more. Mm -hmm. And so that was the response. And that's sort of the better friend's response is if the other person's not having fun, then let's see if we can, get, if we can fill in that gap to where we can both have fun with this. Plus, you remember with checkers, after that, we made a new rule of if um, if one person at the checkers is not having fun, we switch the board. We literally 
move the board. So then the other person now has to play from the other side. Mm. Uh, and like that, that is a fascinating strategy to play because if you are playing that, if checkers and you know, from the start, you're going to pull this move, you play a very different strategy to kill your own side and then give that other person the challenge of trying to win from like a very um, weak position. Uh, which for me was super fun. I love checkers, but checkers is not really that challenging for me. So to suddenly play from Tom's side where he was like losing badly actually was more fun for me. And, and so I loved it. And then he got to play for my strategy. Cause he's like, what were you doing with these? And I'm like, and I would tell him like, okay, that was what I was planning. Take this. And he's like, okay. So then he would try to do it. So then my objective was then to, block him from his side, his weaker side and so on. So this was actually more fun for me. Um, and I loved it once we did that. And then I pretty much only ever wanted to play checkers from that. Let me tell you so many people, adults who play checkers, they don't like that rule. You should like that rule because it just makes it so much more fun and challenging I think a lot of people who say they like checkers, they just like winning. It's not the same as they like a challenge. And again, mm -hmm. I judge people harshly who are not good sports people because it should be about the fun and the challenge, not just winning all the time. It should be about the challenge and the and, strategy. And like, and I definitely now y'all know why I've never lost a game of risk because <laughs> I love strategy. And like, I do judge adults who only win against kids who do not moderate oh, yeah. their skill level with the child's capacity and skills. Versus again, I think that that rule of any time the other person is like, I'm not having fun. Let's rotate on that should be. And we've now done that with monopoly as well, where if somebody says I'm not having fun, it's you turn it. And if there's multiple people like with monopoly it's everybody goes one to the left. We play the Mad Hatter style Monopoly. Yes, we play Mad Hatter. And move it, down, move down. It is so much fun. So many people I know who play Monopoly and never really had fun love that version of Monopoly too, by the way. But again, we're playing games to have fun. We're not playing games to somehow feel superior. Because, like again, Tom and I have had this relationship with each other his whole life. And... So we are in this relationship for like the marathon. This, we assume this, uh, this relationship will last 70, 80 minimum years. And so like, you can't be worried about winning this one time. You need to be more concerned about having a good time for the long time. And so that has given us a very lovely perspective about playing games and about parties because again we're in it for the long fun not the short oh i won ha 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 like it's about having a good time together and inadvertently we've also learned excellent sports personship right because again it should be about having fun not about beating someone or somehow thinking you're superior like Here's the truth. Um, like, so Tom and I, we play this game on our phones called the Goldbergs. And it's, what is it called? Like an, it's like an idle game of some nature. Yeah, it's an idle game. And um, as, as you move along in the game, it moves the story forward. And it's usually episodes of the Goldbergs. Like we're already familiar actually with all the episodes, but um, they've since, uh, and then they have weekend games and we love to play this together. But here I'm going to tell you, I'm not paying attention. Tom beats me every time. Every time. He is just, he's better at this. He thinks like the game designers more than I do, which what a surprise. What do you mean? Most of the game designers are, you know, men in their thirties. What a surprise. Uh, and that, that there's really no women. Okay. Oh my God. I'm so shocked. <laughs> but we still love playing together, even though it's rare every once in a while, I'll beat him at this, but we're not paying attention to that. We're more like, Hey, did you get to the finish of the story of the episode uh, that we're playing? 
did you get to it or do you want here do you want me to save it and I'll, you can watch it with me you can watch the episode the end of the episode play up because we're really about playing together but also to like see each other's strategies because i'll ask him every once in a while like oh my god how are you like getting so good at this particular goldbergs i am so far behind i'm like literally in the 70s because the way they do it is each server is only like a hundred players and so that's how we're able to play together on the weekend games is by joining together we're in the same server so we can actually see each other but sometimes i've said like i'm in the 70s and you're in the 20s what is the strategy you're using that i missed and he'll point out something that i just absolutely missed about it that gives a real leg up yeah like whenever i see glory way up ahead of me it's like Okay, there's something I missed earlier that she right. figured out it doing, and I didn't notice. Mm -hmm. And Where it's the same it? when I see Tom way up ahead, I know, oh, okay, let me go back and look. I must have missed an important detail to the game strategy. And that, that's what I like because I know that, you know, the truth is, Tom and I are pretty well matched. That's why we like playing games together, including board games and card games, is we're really similarly matched so there's not a whole lot of winning and losing or if it is a win it's always a small win because neither of us are really that much better or worse at anything bonnie says i never let my kids win if they beat me they beat me tough love lmao they don't need those bragging rights lmao i beat mom <laughs> uh. <laughs> But again, I do want to point out that for board games, especially when you're playing with little kids, try the thing of if the other person, whether it's mom or the kiddo, says I'm not having fun, you then switch the board. And we actually kind of learned about that from my friend Gabe, whose mom would play with, you know, these three boys, they played Monopoly. They The family liked playing Monopoly. That's who, part of who were asking, like, have you ever finished a game? And they're like, not really. No. Eventually, we all get tired. Or, like, or, or Nick, the oldest one, will literally throw the board game if he thinks he's going to lose. Which, again, guess who I am definitely not friends with? Nick. And, but one of the things like the mom would do was, you know, she'd play till she was tired or she had other things she needed to go do. And then she'd just give all of her stuff to, to whichever kid was at the bottom. Yep. And then watch the chaos. Yes. And that was what gave us the idea to switch the board of if anybody goes, I'm not having fun, switch the board. So we do Mad Hatter rules. Uh, so even our little sister could say, while well, playing Monopoly, I'm not having fun. And it's like, move down, move down. Everybody's moved your seat so that you then get everything the other person had. You just don't have to move all the pieces. And like that was like that is also what drew us to watching and photographing a roller derby, local roller derby around here when it was taking off um in the late 2000s early 2010s was this is just for fun everyone's having fun these two teams are playing against each other but there's no hard feelings against the other they are just trying to win at this game mm -hmm. um we saw recently we haven't watched it yet but we'll i'm sure we'll watch it together eventually uh, on espn plus this little documentary called banana land about this double a baseball team in savannah georgia that is That's just right ridiculous they are the savannah bananas and it's like but they look like they know how to have fun like that's mm -hmm. a that's a baseball game i would go to yeah where th it is and i was thinking i was like that is why the harlem globetrotters are still mm -hmm. around even though their league closed it's and is gone it's been gone for like i don't know 40 60 years so it's so, been gone forever yeah, it was at least 60 now that leaks out, but people still show up to Globetrotter games because it's fun. fun. And that's what the games some, are for. Sorry, you want to say though? Some of the movies that I like the most are ones mm -hmm. where you can tell the animators and everybody yeah. were having a blast. Yes. It's like, oh, like that's what we enjoy about tell. Encanto. Yeah. Was yeah. you can tell those animators were having fun doing mm -hmm. everything. And like, I mean, just the ridiculousness of Bruno. <laughs> Let alone um, I'm okay. I'm the little the rats, the yeah. rats and the Nutella the villas, and the yeah. and especially the first generation um, kids. Yeah, um, all of them are animated with their spouses with you know very interestingly. Mm -hmm. Like you can like, tell, like they the animators related to these characters. 
like Kung Fu Panda or Cloudy mm-hmm. with a Chance of Meatballs. It's like, yes, guys. There's like, just a certain. Who else comes up with legend tales of a legendary warrior whose feet were the stuff of legend and go from there? Like, yes. Or like, or a jello. place on an island that is under the A in Atlantic. Like, yes, yes. When I saw that one, though, I kind of figure one of those animators is from New Zealand. <laughs> Due to the New Zealanders have learned to look on map world maps and see is New Zealand even on the map? Yes, you would not be you would be shocked how often New Zealand is missing from flat maps because that used to be our father's trivia is go find New Zealand on a map and if you can't find it it's because bad map makers. Um, but there's a lot of flat maps that New Zealand is missing or it is partially or even fully obscured mm-hmm. by print. And it's like, uh, could you not have moved the words for Pacific Ocean a little some like rudeness? Uh, Bonnie says, I don't think I've ever heard them say they're not having fun. They just love to play together. Exactly. We're all having fun. Like another thing, like, look, I was rough as a kid. And I, my sportsmanship, really, I didn't get to play a lot with other kids, especially in group sports. So my sportsmanship was poor growing up. And like one of the places where I actually learned my sportsmanship, oddly, um, was in the arcades playing Street Fighter 2. Because the times I tended to play there, there was a guy um, who was a few years older. He was in college at the time who would play and he was really good and yeah he often beat me not every time but most of the times in part because he could do the moves i just hadn't figured out how to do yet Mm -hmm. there was a time before everyone knew how to do a dragon punch right it was the before time so long ago but it was an odd move to do with a with a uh controller at the time people just you know it was a previous century tom yes and but one of the things he would always do was he was the one essentially taught me the good game. Mm-hmm. You know, that was a you know, that was a fun game. Basically, mm-hmm. like he was sh- you know, he really helped show me sportsmanship of he was gracious as a winner and when he lost. Mm-hmm. Of you know, and that it doesn't matter either side of like we're still just having fun. And anyone yeah, I who remember was- when you came home the first time you beat him in a game. And you said to me, I don't know that he's ever going to play with me again. I, I really kind of wish I hadn't won. And I was like, if he is actually good at the game, he should still be willing to play you. And if not, then you've learned a good lesson that he's not worth playing with. Yeah. And then when you came back the next weekend, you're like, look, guess what? He wanted to still play with me. I had I kind of gave him space and I didn't go near him at the arcade. And then he saw me and he came up to me like, hey, kid. We gonna play today before you go, and you were you told me I was surprised, but I was like, yeah, if you want to play, I really didn't think he'd want to play with me, Lori. And I was like, well, then he sounds like a better person than you thought he was. Yeah, because like a lot of the kids my age, because I was so smart, when I beat them, they just didn't want to play again because yeah, it wasn't fun. Because they also didn't understand sportsmanship. Yeah. Teaching the kids chess, got no stress, chess game for Christmas. We'll see how this goes. <laughs> nice. I am curious what the got no stress chess is. But, I mean, yeah, like, you used to, like, enjoy beating our little sister when you were younger. And it wasn't until you were a little older and other people outside of your family showed you what good sports person behavior is like. That you started learning about it's not about beating someone all the time. It's about playing the game and having a good time. And so, like, if you approach playing games as I'm here to have fun, you're going to have a much more enjoyable, sustainable experience than I'm only here to win. Because the problem with only being interested with winning is, number one, you're not having a good time because that's not the goal. And number two, it's not necessarily sustainable. 
And it's not a guarantee. You know, everybody has bad days and you may not realize you're not on your game till like you're halfway through realizing, oh, I'm going to lose this for sure. I've certainly had those experiences. And, but if you're there to have a good time, even though, you know, you're going to lose, you can still be like, I'm here to have a good time. I'm going to, I'm going to try to really like maybe get a little zany here and try some moves. I, I might not normally, because I know I'm not going to win anyway. So I could try some things I've always been curious about versus if you're just there to win. And if you realize halfway through, you're not going to win. You've lost the whole reason you're playing. Hence the whole Nick throwing the Monopoly game board up every time he thought he was going to lose rather than seeing it through. Um, like there, and those things children need to learn and they're going to learn it both by seeing adults model it, but also by playing with their peers and understanding what the point of playing games is. It's a game. It is not war and it is not real life. This is low stakes. Nobody lives or dies if you lose a board game. It's just a game. That's why it's called a game and not life. Right? But like, this I've literally... Game of life. Right? Except we say the game of life instead of just life. We don't call it life. We call it the game of life so that we can tell the difference. I Every single child I have ever worked with, I've had to tell that to. Of like, it's... well. No, there was two children I did not have to because somebody else had already given them that little lecture. Uh, this is a game. This is just meant to be fun. If you're not having fun, you're playing it wrong. And they're like, wait, that's what it's supposed to be doing? Like, they don't know because nobody's told them. And uh, you see, like, Tom, nobody actually told him you're just supposed to have fun. And he certainly didn't listen to me. I did tell him. He wasn't listening. Uh, that's how ADHD You were my sister. What did you know? I know. You've literally said that to me so many times that if I had a dollar for every time you said this to me in my life, I would be wealthy. You're my sister. What do you know? I know everything. I'm older than you and I have lived through it. <laughs> but like he was, what were you like an early teenager? You were like in middle school when that I was in middle school. I was a preteen. Yeah. That's how old Tom was before someone else showed him it's okay to lose and still have a good time and want to play with somebody again and it not, again, be high stakes. Um, Noah says it took being with and explaining games to Haley. Uh, Bonnie said... Oh, they better grow up. I understand that. Ah, yes. Bonnie says the board is labeled and you play with a card deck that teaches the moves. Then you gradually go into playing regular. Oh, that's very nice. That's interesting. More online video games need to hear this chat. Yes. I mean, again, so here's why this is, this is literally the whole point of the episode. This is why play and parties are so important to human beings of all ages. Because hopefully if you play games enough, eventually someone will teach you this incredibly important lesson. If you're not having fun, you're playing the game wrong. And the fun should not be in the winning. The fun should be in the playing. And that's why, yeah, I don't enjoy playing all sorts of games because some games are just not that much fun to me. Even though ironically, often the... Hmm, did y'all see? Ironically... A bunch of the games that I don't enjoy playing are the ones I never lose at. And that's part of why they're not that much fun to me because they're not actually that challenging for me because I am there for the fun. I am there for the challenge. I'm there to be kept on my toes and be not sure which strategy will work. And that's what I want. I <clears> want a good time. And understanding that the point of games is to be fun has helped me steer my way. And yes, in our family, God, Tom, how many board games do we own? And card games, like, oh, God, it's, I would say it's probably definitely more than 100. An underappreciated game we highly recommend is called Ninja Burger. I'm literally looking at, like, all the games that live here right here. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Just yeah, we have a couple totes full of games. One of my favorite that we play <laughs> as a family is Cash and Guns. Cash or Guns. Cash and guns. Cash and guns. Oh my goodness. Yes. You're a mafia and you're divvying up the loot. And uh, 
start shooting at each other with these styrofoam gun cutouts. <laughs> and you have blanks and you have bullets. And then, yeah, it's really fun. What was that game that we play every once in a while? Uh, that was one of those. I can't remember where the company is, but it's not El Cheapo. Although that's the one. That's the name I always think it should have been called. The game company should have been called El Cheapo because it's like. Oh yes. But I thought where, there was another Steve Jackson game stuff. Yeah, like so. Okay, in the game, I think it's supposed to be Wild West, and you have duels every once in a while. Now the game came with just a few little corks like the kind you put in wine bottles and you're supposed to throw those at your opponent. There is no point to this part of the game. Like it doesn't determine who wins the next round or anything because you're just throwing these across the table at each other. So, but here was the problem. Like you're supposed to do it for a solid 60 seconds and they only gave us eight corks. Cause you're supposed to then keep re-throwing the corks. But uh, yeah, that was not working for us. So in our family, we came up with balled up socks, clean only. And everybody would like literally pull out all their drawers of balled up, you know, socks and like literally have totes of socks for each duel. Cause like you can have, I think up to four players, but only two people can duel at a time. And so it's like, oh, we have a duel. And like suddenly you hear this scraping of the boxes and it's boxes and boxes of clean socks. And the whole point is you clear everything else and like the duel starts and you're just throwing socks at each other for 60 seconds as per the rules. And let me tell you how much more fun that game got. <laughs> you're not trying to hunt these like tiny little corks, but instead it's just big old balled up clean socks that you're throwing at your opponent and they're throwing back and then they're catching more and throwing them. And it's just ridiculous. Nobody gets hurt. It's fantastic. It's fun. So uh, we used to have Duplos. Yes. So we had Duplo boards and oh, rubber wow. bands. Oh, so you dear. just stretch those rubber bands across the Duplo boards. Like, oh. And so you had like a machine gun of rubber bands. We had mountains of rubber bands behind our couches. Oh, no. It was Imagine. so fun. The very secrets, cheap. Very fun. The secrets various families have, like, what they stockpile for game playing. Every family is different. Spence says, yeah, video games with no at the beginning was a big source of conflict. You can only unplug someone's controller and Smash Brothers so many times to even the odds before yelling starts. Me yelling at him. I mean, rude. Great game. We're not really strangers. Yeah. And that kind of brings me to, so for next hour. Yes. What do you want to talk about? Um, let's talk about parties. Let's talk about all the tricks and tips we have learned mm -hmm. um, over our many years of going to I've hosted a party yeah. since I've been in What? Ah, right. Excellent. All right. So here is a wonderful time to make sure you have something to drink. Do you have a snack? Because I, Tom made a 10 minute prime rib roast timer. And that is what we're about to watch. So good, good luck. Time. And we'll see y'all back here in approximately 10 minutes.
Fancy meeting y'all here. What are you doing here? I just can't quit, y'all. <sighs> Two and a half years in, I'm still here. It's a habit. Now you know why I was married for 11 years. <laughs> I just don't know how to quit things. Yeah, I thought it would be the other part about talking about play is let's talk about the the part that makes neurodivergent people anxious. Let's talk about parties. I honestly think that a serious aspect of parties that can make neurodivergent people anxious is just merely not having enough accurate experience at going to parties where it's a mix of neurotypicals and neurodivergent folks. Because there are video games <clears throat> that try to simulate party experiences and it's very obvious that the party, de the game developers have never been to real parties. <clears throat> like yeah. at least that were manned by humans and not puppies or kittens. Like these games are similar to what you will experience if you just literally sit in a playpen filled with puppies. Sure. Absolutely. Um, but they are not a good simulation of what it is like to experience a mixed party. Ignore the cat in the background. Why would I want to? Totally fine. Even the blur is just like, is that part of you or not? I can't tell. It's, it's a growth that keeps moving. <laughs> Got a so, weird shoulder there. So, in my early 20s, <clears throat> I endeavored to get over my anxiety about party going by hosting a shit ton of parties. How much is a shit ton? It is a very large ton. It is up to a party a month. And what is a party but merely a gathering of human beings who have all agreed or been tricked into being there together? You think I'm kidding. But several times I have had little get togethers, like especially out at restaurants where various other members of the party tricked other people to come, to come mm -hmm. because they knew that that person would not willingly attend a party. But they would meet them for drinks or meet them for appetizers or something. And then, oh, this party just happened to be here. Uh, sit down. You're here now. <clears throat> because, again, as you all know, one of the things that I really work on is to make safe spaces for folks. Now, I when why? Because I want a safe space myself. Um, and so, but they knew, like, once they get there, they'll feel fine. It's just they've had so many negative experiences, they will not willingly go into a potentially negative or toxic situation understandable versus i was just trying to desensitize myself again also because i had had enough negative experiences that i was trying to desensitize myself to the expectation that it's going to be a terrible experience because i'd had so many neutral to negative experiences at places that people call parties prior not all of them were negative I've actually met people and made, you know, lifelong friendships at parties. But that's not how the human brain works. It amplifies any negative experience as if that is always the, the de default experience. And any positive experience is, oh, it was that one time. And it's never going to be like that again. When in reality, it's just a mixed bag. You never know what you're going to get. So that was what I was endeavoring was at least once a month to arrange some sort of get together either at my house out in public in or at someone else's house um where the, but i was still the host that was the plan it was not perfect i did not always do every single month but i did most months it was once 
every once in a while it might be two in a month to make up for the times where it was zero in a month. Like the holidays sometimes are hard to do. Um, so that was what I did. I did that for what, like two and a half, three years because I was mm -hmm. determined. This was my early twenties. I was determined to be what I thought was a functional adult by the time I was in my late twenties. And everybody said that the way you, you get better in life is you have to network. You have to know a lot of people. And I did not know how to expand my social group in ways that were available down here in South Mississippi, since I do not have a lot of shared interest with the majority of people in South Mississippi. The reasons being, I am not Southern Baptist because I have never believed it was okay to own slaves. But I do think it's absolutely okay to have a cocktail. And why do I think it's okay to have a cocktail? Because I have been prescribed this literally by now eight different actual medical doctors who are like, Glory, you need a drink. I'm going to prescribe you that you have to at least three times a week sit down with a cocktail or a beer or a glass of wine and just enjoy life. Minimum. And if you enjoyed the first drink, you need to have a second. <laughs> Hello, Jules. Do you know how many doctors? eight doctors so far in my life i'm in my so middle. you can have 16 point. drinks in a day <laughs> well, at least i had enough a second maybe i've had a third <laughs> it's actually hard for us to really drink much because we don't get much out of it and because of our mass and our family genetics it doesn't affect us much like it takes a lot to have an effect yeah, and, and I just still feel very <clears throat> uncomfortable about getting sloppy, inebriated anywhere but in my own house. And then again, it's my own house, so that feels weird, too. Anyway, that's a whole nother matter, and that's not important. But my point just being, I'm not Southern Baptist. I also, I would like to think that I am not racist um, versus the people down here, many are proud to be. Racist, sexist, misogynistic. Uh, they also, uh, down here, they believe feminism is an F word. And uh, I disagree. So, like, there's many things I do not have in common with the majority of people who live in South Mississippi. It So it made it very difficult for me to explain my social group. However, when I asked a lot of people, I surveyed a whole lot of people, how do you expand your social group if you're not doing it through church or confederate reenactment crap uh yeah and and other such questionable activities how do you do it and the one thing everybody said was parties i mean i even asked my doctors how do you explain your social group if you're not you know southern baptist racist how do you do it and the one thing they said was parties. You you go to parties, you get invited to parties. Well, how do I get invited to parties? Well, you have to host parties. That was what everybody said, the same dang thing. If you want to go be invited to parties, you have to host parties. And so then I did the thing that, every, you know, a, a librarian would do, which I researched online. How do you host parties? Because I did not know, because we did not really grow up at a house that officially called get-togethers parties. So I really wasn't sure. This may have also been what led to this channel. Yes. <laughs> and what led to my years of private finishing school for bright, eager young people uh, and not so young people. So um, was so I started throwing get togethers and I found that it was a challenge to get people to come to my house for parties, but that it was easier to get to people to come together, say, at a restaurant or like at a festival or an event, it tended to be, not that it's a perfect system, but if you can get a couple people to show and you tell them, hey, yeah, you know, you should bring your friends, then maybe a third of them will actually bring a friend. And then you can meet more people. And then once you meet more people, you know, you can exchange phone numbers, email addresses, Facebook, whatever, so that you can invite them to the next get together and the way that you get them to do that is you say at the end of your get together to each person individually. So it seems spontaneous. 
listen up. This is actually a really, this is an effective tip slash uh, psychological manipulation. Here you go. This is what my degree was for. You say, as they're saying goodbye, I had a really wonderful time with you tonight. And then most human beings, without thinking, will automatically go, yeah, me too. I had a great time. And then here's the wild part. They will then think it. So if you did not say that when they left, they might think, oh, kind of neutral. Like, I don't know if I had a good time or not. But because you said, I had a wonderful time hanging out with you tonight. And they go, oh, yeah, me too. I had a great time with you. This was fun. And you say, we should totally do this again sometime soon. And they're like, I would love that. And you'd say, oh, let me get your Facebook thing. Or, you know, here's my phone number. I'll put my phone in your phone. And then you message yourself so that they, they, you have their phone number. And you're like, I'll let you know the next time we're getting together. Like, cool, cool. And then when they leave, they will then remember the event later that night. And then the next day, go, yes, I did have a great time because they've already said it out loud to you. They will then think it. And that is how you manipulate people. <laughs> <clears throat> it works. Okay. Look, it just, and why, why does this actually matter? Because in particular, if you're, if you are partying with neurodivergent people, that anxiety they have will overwrite the good time they actually had. And then all they will think about is their after party anxiety as the back of their mind replays everything that happened, but makes it 10 times worse than it actually was. But if instead you can overwrite that by beating them to the pass and making them say to you how, what a good time they had. That's it. So even when their anxiety was like, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. They will then, their brain will keep going back to, but I said I had a great time to her. So I guess overall, I did have a good time. Yeah. That is literally how you do it. So then, then the next you time. take Roy outside them, out the back. Okay. The next time you invite them to something, they're so much more likely to come because they remember that they said they had a good time last time. Yes. As I said. Look, I know it's a manipulation, but it's kind of necessary, especially for people who have anxiety and pretty much all neurodivergent people have various levels of anxiety because we have to live in a neurotypical world, which is always telling us that we're wrong and that we shouldn't exist. So it's anxiety producing. And so the way to circumvent that kind of back of the brain anxiety thing that will inevitably happen after a get together is you get them to say out loud to you that they had a wonderful time. And the way you get them to do that is you say it first. And then they're going to want to mirror it. Because you're smiling and you're, you know, you're, you had a good time, right? I mean, don't lie. If you had a terrible time, don't say you had a great time. Although, if you had a terrible time at the party, but you actually enjoyed the time you spent with that person, you should still absolutely say that. <clears throat> you specify, I had a really good time at this party talking with you. Yeah, I had a wonderful time at this party with you. Or I had a really, I'm so glad I met you. See, that does, even if you had a terrible time at the party, if you really are glad you met this person, you should absolutely say that to them before they leave. So that is my little trick. And it is a very useful trick. Um, Please only use it in a morally kind compassionate way please do not negatively manipulate people i realize i am teaching people how to be like a little bit of a sociopath so i'm hoping you will all use it for good and not evil um but yes this is the trend and true method and then i also wanted to come and bring up the so if you're hosting a party one of the things you can do to really make sure that this party goes better <clears throat> is the thing everyone has in common at this party is you. So you know all the people at this party. What do they have in common? Let them know. That is what a good host is supposed to do is introduce and be the icebreaker for these strangers mm -hmm. of what these people may have in common and want and enjoy talking and conversing about to get to know each other. And so the way you do this, and I learned this from old movies, and literally, if you know two people that you think should know each other, because they have some shared common interests, like they both like painting miniatures, for instance. Maybe they paint, one paints fantasy miniatures, and one paints... Warhammer. Uh, okay, Warhammer. 
miniatures. Then you go, Jim, I have someone I absolutely want you to meet. Come with me. Right? And Jim follows you. And you go, Bob, this is Jim. I absolutely want you to meet him. Jim, this is Bob. Both of you enjoy painting miniatures. And I have seen both of you and your painted miniatures and you're both so talented and I could not believe that you two don't know each other. Also, here are two other things that you two might have shared interest about. So, Bob, you and Jim are both married and you both married in your early 20s. And Jim, Bob has always been interested in trains but has never actually gotten to ride a train. Jim here, it actually works for the train system. Enjoy, fellas. Bye-bye. And then, you know, like, or like you wait a second to make sure they actually talk to each other. They go, oh, and then turn away. No, no, no. Let's have a conversation. Uh, and like, and you can actually lubricate the conversation by, so trains, we like them, right? And eventually they'll, if you stand there long enough, they will actually interact with more than you. They'll interact with each other. And then at the point that the conversation seems to be going well, you can then, please excuse me, while they keep talking, you just say it real low, please excuse me. And then you go off to the next one where, Ethel, I have someone I absolutely wanted to introduce you to. I, I think you two are going to like each other very much. Natalie, this is Ethel. And you do the same thing. And that is all it takes. It does not actually take more than that. I used to think that this took magic and like a wand. It does not. That is literally all it takes. It's just like in the movies. And it absolutely works. Um, it helps to wait till everybody has had a drink or something to eat first. So that they're not hungry and thirsty. Um, however, you can go. You both love to cook. And I have had both of your cooking. And I just thought you two should absolutely know each other. And then you go, hey, Natalie, you made this amazing chicken thing that you brought to this party. Ethel, have you tried it? And then Ethel go, oh, I did. You made that? And then usually that conversation is then pretty good. You can stay there for a moment. And then you're like, please excuse me. And yeah. If, they, if you, they just have personalities in common, you don't know of any direct things, find something that one can compliment the other on. And that should, mm -hmm. that'll usually get things started. Um, and that is how you actually help enmesh your network of people so that more of them are likely to come to parties because if they know that at your parties, they're more likely to know more and more people, they're then more likely to come because people don't like to go to a party where they only know the host because nobody wants to be clingy. But if you only know one person, it is super awkward. Versus if you're like, oh, yeah, I know almost everybody at this party. Yeah, I'll come. Because, like, there'll be uh, there'll be something we could talk about. Or I can update everybody on my guitar lessons or my PhD or whatever. They'll want to know what's going on because I mentioned it last time. Da -da -da. All right. So that, like, people are more likely to come to your parties if they know. And so sometimes when you invite people, they'll ask who else is coming. And what they actually want to hear is people they know, they already know are coming. And maybe one or two people they've always wanted to know. But if you don't know who they've always wanted to know, you don't have to mention that. You just mention people they already know because people don't like to go to a party where they don't know ever, anybody. That's all. Oh, and um, also we say Drake, like literally just, it does. it's not necessarily alcoholic or anything, just actually no, no. something to drink. Because yeah, it's just... hard to talk when you keep clearing your throat. Right. And also... Having, although having something, them eat something sweet, have them snack on something sweet also improves things a lot because humans have this weird quirk where it is much harder for humans to say and discuss negative things if they have something sweet in their mouth. If they're literally tasting something sweet, they will talk sweeter. So when someone arrives at a party, if you definitely want to introduce them to somebody before that other person leaves, like say somebody arrives um, like in the middle of the party, um, what I have seen hosts and hostesses do to me uh, is, oh, hey, you're here. Come on. And they take you immediately to the food and drink section. And they're like, oh, what do you want to drink? And you're like, oh, I guess I'll have a Coke. And they're like, okay, cool. And, you know, they'll help get your drink and like, Oh, do you want a little snack plate? I could like start working on your snack plate while you pour your Coke. I'm like, oh, okay. I just 
what do you want me to put on it? Like, don't just automatically put food on people's plates because you never know their dietary situation going on. But like, oh, what do you think of this? Do you want this? Right. So you're you're converse, you're, you're talking there. You, you're lubricating them up socially by talking to them. Here you go. <clears throat> you watch them take a sip of the drink, especially if it's sweet. Cool. Now, come on out. There's someone I absolutely want to introduce you to before they leave. And so there they are with they have a drink and they have a plate or at least they have a drink. Right. It's a prop. People feel safer when they have a prop at a party. So look cups are great for that. And they, they take you to the person. They're like, they just arrived. But I wanted before you left, I wanted to be sure to introduce you to them. I have been talking about them for like the last several times I've seen you. This is them. That, and then, you know, you do the same little Bob, Jim, that, you know, the whole thing. And again, the more the people at your party know each other, the more likely they are to come to your parties again, the more likely they are to also form more a stronger social network which means they too will feel supported and they too will more likely live longer they will have better mental health and physical health they will have a they will live a much longer life before they start experiencing a cognitive decline because they have a strong and mesh social network that you as the host of the party are helping ensure you are doing wonderful things for your social network when you throw parties All right, and now for from the other side. Okay. So here's one I actually have a little more. Don't ask me about my side as a host, so I believe. Yeah. So now from the other side, um, is that I have I think a bit more experience on, which is I don't really put them. We'll just call them college parties. <clears throat> parties that you hear about, you don't necessarily know the host. You just sort of vaguely know there's a group of socializing going on. And that, you know, outsiders are welcome. So you're going to go to this. What do you do? Because you don't have a lot of friends and, you know, you got nothing to do right now. So let's go do that. Um, how do you handle this situation? Again, as Gloria brought up, um, drink cups and, you know, if there are snacks there, having that are great props to be holding. They give your hands something to do. They also give you an easy way to take a moment when you need to. You can always just take a sip or take a snack when you need to collect your thoughts together. And then when it comes to the people of like, you don't know anyone at this party, what are you going to do? It's kind of intimidating. Very simple, very simple. Look for the conversations. Stay, you don't, you don't necessarily need to be in front looking at the person telling the story. Just stay close. Listen, see if it's something that you are interested in. And if there is a lull, then, you know, add in anything you know and see what people's reactions are and to see, like, is this the kind of group that is interested in your approach to this subject? So if they're talking about trains, is, you know, your knowledge about, you know, Lionel H size trains versus N size track trains? you know, interesting to them, or are this group only interested in full-size trains? If they're just interested in the machinery at full size for commercial uses. And if it's not stuff they're interested in, don't worry about it. Just, you know, back up a little, go find another group. And you're just going to float among the different groups that are already going to form at these parties, conversing, listening for, is there, are they talking about anything of interest to you? Because that's how you build a friendship. That's how you build any friendship, really, is commonalities. And so you're just at these parties, parties listening for commonalities, whether it's interest or life experiences. You know, Gloria, at the very beginning of the show, was talking about, you know, how, you know, the high stakes situation versus the low stakes situation. And, you know, like, how do you handle a doctor's office? And, you know, that's college parties are where you hear a lot of these conversations where people will tell this week's horror story that they experienced. And, you know, you can see what other people add in. If you don't have any anything to add in, you can stay silent unless like they all look at you and ask and then you just go, no, I'm just keep going. I'm learning too. Like people, when they're just telling a story to a group of people are often just looking for facial expression reactions. 
Mm-hmm. Again, that's a good reason to practice your facial uh, expression yeah. reactions in the mirror before you go to a party. But then, you know, what they're looking like, whoa. Oh, no. Then what happened? Oh, my God. How did you deal with it? Like, it's it, it's only a couple facial expressions you need for that. And, like, so you can just come in and sort of, like, vibe with a semicircle of people listening to a story. Again, holding your solo cup as your prop. And just, uh-huh. Yes, these are real in America. Yes. So um, just Hollywood movies. Right. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm. Really, they now come in nine ounce size. It's great. And like, like I've worked a lot on my listening faces because mm-hmm. it really helps encourage people to keep talking and not feel that they're being judged. And uh, one no, thing I did want to add in that is the, how do I put this? A hallmark of the poorly socialized neurodivergent. Mm-hmm. When they, someone is telling a story, whether it is a story of what happened to them or just a, they are relating a story that they heard. Something to avoid is saying how you would have done something. You are not part of the social group yet. But what you can do is ask could they have done this or that so that it stays with their story control and they can add in the details of, you know, like, this is why I couldn't do that. I was not able to because, or I have never thought of that. That's interesting. I will have to try that next time, but see how, if you're asking them if they were able to do something is different than telling them what you would have done. That is where Mm -hmm. you're trying to steal their story away. Mm-hmm. to try to take it over and no one likes that oh look at that we did some running tonight oh goodness um and and that is where we you know we talk about the so the people the people like that enjoy seeing each other at parties and social events are the ones where They want the crowds that add that when the person tells a story, the rest of the crowd just enjoys it. And if they say anything, it's to add to their story where they ask them, what about this or what about that? Could you have? At the end of the story, though, uh, like when everybody's just sort of standing around and there's sort of this like conversation gap for a moment. That is an excellent time, by the way, to go. Hi, my name is Glory. Thank you so much for telling the story. It is not time for you to then immediately go into your version of the story that right. happened to you. Like you just say, thank you so much for, you know, you, t- you introduce yourself. Often people will then say, oh, my name is Jim. But if they don't, you say, what is your name? You could say that. That is absolutely acceptable, socially acceptable to say at a party. So you're like, well, thanks so much, Jim, Bob, whatever. You, know, you don't say whatever. That's rude. Bob. You know what I'm saying. Thank you so much. And then you just sort of vibe away if you feel like, you know, that maybe it's getting awkward. You just vibe away uh, and you're fine. Okay. And then later in the party, uh this is the, before you leave, if you see Bob, you say, you go up to Bob and say, hey, well, we're about to head out, but it was so great meeting you. And then Bob's going to go, yeah, your your name's Glory, right? Yeah, see you later. Oh, where are you going next? Oh, we're going to go to Waffle House or we're going to go to IHOP. Um, and Bob might say, well, we were about to leave too. Maybe we'll see you there. Like, cool. We'll see you. Bye. And like now you know someone. You are like, again, and Bob is glad he knows you because you did the hard part of actually introducing yourself. So he didn't have to feel awkward going, Hello, stranger. What is your name? My name is Bob. Um, and so <clears throat> maybe the next time or when you see Bob out somewhere in the water, go, hey, I know you. Even if you can't remember his name. You, hey, we, right. I know you. I remember you from some party, right? Yeah, that's right. Your face looks familiar. It is perfectly acceptable to do this because you are essentially starting a new relationship. Even if you're not planning to be best friends with Bob, that's fine. But now you know somebody, and Bob is happy to know you too. Because what if you two run into each other at another party again? People don't like to go to a party where they know no one. Versus, oh, I I have had people like Bob say to me later when I've run into him at a party, 
hey, Glory, we were wondering if we were going to see you again. Like, oh, that's awesome, Bob. This is my brother, Tom. Do you two know each other? And they'll like look at each other. Mm, and it's like, well, Tom, this is Bob. Bob, this is Tom. I met Bob at party. He told this fantastic story about something. And Bob's like, oh, yeah, I remember that story. And like Tom has an interest in this thing. You were telling a story and, and either Bob's going to tell the story again or Bob's going to ask Tom, hey, tell me about this interest you have in this shared thing. Da, da, da. Let's see. Noah says only ever say thanks, Jim Bob, whatever. <laughs> you never plan to see them again. Yeah. Okay. Here is why that is bad advice. <laughs> As Gloria and I have both proven out here. So you're thinking, oh, I'm never going to see them again. Au contraire, since you have been in a location where they are, the chances are that are much higher that you will see them again because you share at least a small amount of the same socializing concepts as they do. Mm -hmm. Even you though you may make... never see them at a party again, yeah. you don't know what business you're going to see them at. You're going to see them somewhere again, I promise grocery you. Store. You, grocery store, a festival a class that you are just now going back to college to get you know your phd after 20 years guess who's going to be the surprise professor wow. so that is where burning bridges unnecessarily often burns you back so like you truly act like you're going to run into every person you've ever met again it is the thing i live in fear of of running into my exes and thankfully, I often do not travel alone. So thankfully, most people who travel with me know if I look highly uncomfortable, it is because I'm probably been caught by an ex at a Walmart. Please get me out of it. Uh, <laughs> like, please go, oh, Glory, hi. Oh, it's like, hi, it's, oh, it's she is my ex-girlfriend. And they're like, well, we got to go, right? We're going to, I was like, oh, yes, we have to go. So sorry. Bye-bye. It's great seeing you. I'm so glad you're alive. Bye. You were going to brunch, right? Yeah. We were going to the check register at least to check out. Yes. Um, <laughs> but um, like, yeah, more than likely, statistically speaking, because I've actually seen some stats on this. If you have ever been introduced to a person, you are so much more likely to see them again in your life. Even if than, you meet them at an airport. Because it means that your social travels are similar enough to them that you're going to see them again so truly as my our father used to say be careful about burning bridges only burn the bridges you absolutely want to burn and none of the ones that you just feel like burning if you cannot avoid burning it or you need to burn it in the hopes that they never cross that bridge again those are the only acceptable bridges to burn metaphorically not real <clears throat> i'm not actually advocating real arson I mean, there right. was a story Charlie told, I think last, was it just last week? Hmm. About this person who kept, every time they would see them in a restaurant or something, would just point from across the room at Charlie and go, you. Right. And there, Charlie felt obligated to, again, explain the story of why that person just acted that way. And that inadvertently just ruined this person's reputation everywhere. No one was going to know the stories involved about this person. But since they kept forcing the point... Because they had, you know, just, yeah, if you have had an interaction with someone, there's a high chance you'll have an interaction with them again. So, yes, it's something to keep in mind. Absolutely do not burn bridges you don't have to, even when it feels justified. Like, there's only a few times when somebody's physical safety is threatened, that mm -hmm. is an appropriate time to burn a bridge. But there really are most other appropriate times that you are more than likely to run into a person again. So try your best not to burn bridges, even though I know it sometimes feels justified, and it probably is. Uh, yes, Everett. Hello, Everett. Everett says, I have a percussion piece called Made the Bridges I Burn Light My Way. <laughs> it's a very Everett sentiment and piece, to be perfectly yes. honest. I mean, it's a good piece, though. It is a good piece. But yeah, that's why one time of like it's when you're just starting out, going to stuff like college parties or just parties in general can seem very intimidating because these are new experiences. You don't know any of the social norms. You don't know how to what to say, what to do, 
And we hope these kind of these little tips really help get you started of everyone wants each other to succeed at parties and play. We're all there to have a good time. And that's the other part to always remember. If people don't want you to have a good time there, then you need to leave because these people are not for you. I would say probably the most important thing to be aware of to like go to any social interaction like a like to play with folks or to parties um or even if you're going out to a festival where you don't necessarily know anybody but you know to just you're gonna go and maybe hear some music and eat some funnel cake is before you go go practice your smile in the mirror and make sure it looks great like make sure you've really got a great smile on today because a really great smile will open so many doors. A really great smile that you flash at somebody is a wonderful way to start an introduction. I have made friends at festivals where I did not know a soul. But y'all, I got a thousand watt smile that I've been working on for literally decades. And I flashed it at somebody because of course somebody had a cute baby. And, you know, I have a weakness for cute fat babies. Oh my God, I have a weakness. I just... Their little, their little fat legs. Oh my god, they're little, they're so sausagey. Ah, <laughs> I just love. I'm, and I'm not touching anybody's baby, but I will smile. I like a little baby, and you know that makes parents happy. And like said, hi, my name is Glory. What is your name? What is your name, baby? And they're like, uh, this is Fred. Hello, Fred. How are you? And then you know, like smile. You know, it, Sometimes I've struck a conversation up with people. And then again, as you know, because you ran into them once, it means you're probably going to run into them again, usually within two years, statistically speaking. If you ran into strangers one time and had a conversation, statistically speaking, you are likely to run into them again within a two-year time period. Um, and so when you run into them, it's like, hey, so where's Fred? How's his, where's the baby? I know the baby's not a baby anymore, but shouldn't he be running around somewhere? And then be like, oh, he's with his grandma, da, 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 whatever. You never know. Like, that is actually how I've gotten jobs before. From strangers I met at a festival and ran into six months later at Walmart. And then they're like, how are you doing? Like, oh, fine. I'm looking for a job. So I came to pick up more printer paper. They're like, oh, what do you do? Like, oh, well, pretty much anything in an office, quite honestly. Da, da, da. Like, well, we're looking for a temporary um, secretary and file <laughs> clerk. I know it's not much, but maybe they'll get you through so you get a full-time job like, oh, that would be great, actually. And from there, I have gotten, you know, jobs that on the surface seem like impossible to get because the person in the file room was like, I really like you, Gloria. I know somebody who's actually hiring somebody full-time at another office, and I hate to see you go, but I'd love to be able to see you again. So let me go call her up and see if they're still interviewing people. And I've literally gotten jobs that way from somebody I ran into with a fat baby at a festival. And that is so like, you just don't know. So that's the one thing I say is go before you go to any social engagement, go check your smile in the mirror because you never know. It opens so many doors, y'all. So absolutely. And since, all right, since we've heard Gloria's, you said you were hosted, you hosted a party. How'd that go? What were you doing? Yeah, it was great. Um, so, I am a nerd. I enjoy Harry Potter. <laughs> so, don't um, have to that vibe. You hide it well. It just so happens that in my field of work, a lot of people do. And so, I wanted to host a Harry Potter party. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I wanted to do it like Hogwarts feast, the, the first day of Hogwarts. And so what I did was I wanted it to be like a girls party. And so I had a list of all the girls that I worked with at work and made the list. I hand wrote invitations on parchment paper, wax sealed it, bought little stuffed owls and tied the letters to them and put them on their desks at work. So they had their owl delivered letters of invitations. I spent a day and a half or two just cooking and cooking. Like, I had Pinterest boards of different types of food at the Hogwarts feast and stuff. We had sorting hat cupcakes. So the cakes were different colors of the houses. And then you couldn't see through the, the cupcake paper what color they were. 
And it was chocolate frosting with a marshmallow on top to make it the sorting hat. <laughs> nice. So, like, we just had a blast. And so we we ate and we ate. <laughs> we just talked. Um, and, um, yeah, we just, we just had a blast. It was at my apartment. I had this table, and it can have two leaves put in it, so it fit all of us. Nice. And, um, yeah, it was, it was just fun hanging out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's awesome. Again, yeah, everyone's got a common interest. We're all mm-hmm. going to come together to enjoy playing with this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, like, in, in my field of work, like, I... They're all nerdy in some way or another. <laughs> like, some people come in with Harry Potter jerseys to work or, like, Star Wars <laughs> graphic tees. Like... They have the figurines on their desk. Like, it's, we're, we're all nerdy. And so, um, yeah, like some people couldn't come because they had other engagements. But, um, like, I think them knowing that I put in the work for it mm-hmm. uh, made it more enticing to come mm-hmm. than a off the cuff last minute thing. Yeah. So, yeah, it was it was really fun, but uh, I don't know. <laughs> Party planning would be fun, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know it's something Glory enjoys. Yeah, I enjoy Party planning and vacation planning. Oh, I do all of our Disney vacation planning. Yep. My sister did our England Scotland trip planning, and I did our Disney World planning. Nice. Nice. Like Jules, isn't being a nerd a requirement in the job description? Pretty much. Like for our Disney World vacation, I had two itineraries for every day. I had the high intensity and the low intensity version. <laughs> nice. <clears throat> yeah. That's a good <laughs> yoga instructor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this one includes the nap. This one is go, go, go. Mm hmm. That sounds good. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, I um that's actually how I met Natalie. Was part of the trying to throw a party or trying to host a party every month. Um it was one of the very first parties that I ever threw on my own. Uh the part I did not understand was the internet is filled with introverts. And that I am an extrovert. And that is why people did not jump at the chance to come to a party was because introverts. Um, so only two people came to that party. Uh, but and again, I tried to host just an all female party. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I called it a hen party and I had a pasta bar and with various sauces and slow cooker, you know, chasing dishes and it was delicious. And, um, Yeah, Natalie came, and that is actually how I met Natalie in real life. And and then we became fast friends from there. And uh, the other person uh, that came, I had met her at a party, like what, I guess, a couple months prior. And I did not realize that is who she was online, on LiveJournal, because that long ago it was on LiveJournal, that I invited everyone in the Hattiesburg area that's female to come to my party. And... (laughs) And she came as well because she already knew me and I didn't know she knew me. And um, she came and we hung out and it was super fun. And they all tried on my enormous collection of aprons. <laughs> and it was it was a good time. Um, but yeah, I have both. I've known them both now for over 20 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of like that, because I hosted a party, I actually met them again. And that was that was the important part. And if you want to be an excellent party guest, offer to help with the dishes. <laughs> well, it turned out Tara was the other person who came and she likes washing dishes, which that's weird, but fantastic. And I, it was right before I was able to afford a dishwasher. Mm-hmm. So yeah, God bless her. She was like, oh no, you guys just keep wash dishes. It makes me happy. I'm like, oh, you can, you can come anytime you want now. Uh, Eve says, host a party here. There's a higher chance I'll attend. I mean, not a 100% chance. <laughs> I'm a liar. 
But yeah, like I found out that I actually love hosting parties. It's fun to either come up with a theme and come up with a menu mm -hmm. and um, just to see who shows up and to hang out. Uh, I love making music playlists for the party. It's just fun. And Eva, I would love to help you plan your Disney trip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not like I watch hours of Disney news content every week. <laughs> <laughs> I have a problem! But yeah, like, it's kind of one of the things Tom and I've talked about, about um, ideally the next place we live in. We would absolutely love to it be a place that's more conducive to hosting parties. Double ovens and a dishwasher. Yeah. Sir. Because, like, there's not really any parking here where we are. Mm. And what parking there is, it's not good parking. It's, it's on a very steep incline. And we would we would love to have a place more conducive to having people over. So what are the rules for bringing a gift for the host? So you don't want to bring something that's going to cause the host to have to immediately deal with it. Mm -hmm. So like here, I brought you a thing that now needs to be cooked immediately versus like you can't necessarily guarantee they'll even have refrigerator space in that moment because they probably already cleared out the refrigerator for all the party food. So mm -hmm. don't bring a turkey, let alone a raw turkey. Like I brought you this as a gift, like, or a frozen turkey when you don't know that they have a deep freezer with space mm -hmm. versus something that would be ideal. Even if it is a bottle of wine or like Martinelli's sparkling uh, apple cider, mm. that does not need to be immediately opened. Especially if you have not already opened it. You could have that another time. Or flowers. Especially, I would not recommend bringing flowers unless you also bring a vase. Because what I have learned in the 21st century is, I'm like the only person who exists who owns vases. No one else owns a vase anymore. So don't bring flowers. I have one. A vase that will fit those flowers. So like if you bring long stem flowers, they may only have little bud vases. And if you ask, do you have any vases? They're like, yes, because they're thinking bud vases. And what you brought is a huge bouquet of lilies and roses. So that is why I recommend if you're bringing flowers, it's probably best to also bring a vase. It does not have to be an expensive one. We're literally talking a 5 to $10 vase. But something that is appropriate for the flowers that you are bringing, um, that's appropriate. But also like something that, oh, you could open this another time. Don't worry about this. And they can set it aside and open it later. Like say a charcuterie board. Say cheese. Bringing like the pretty board with the little thingies. Like again, they could open that anytime. Just make sure they know where it is when you're leaving. Because at a party, everything's kind of a world. Also, you can say, Hey, I have a lovely hostess gift for you, but I know you're busy right now. Let me, I'll be sure to give it to you later. And they'll be like, okay, cool. And you can either give it to them as they, as you are leaving, or you can say, Hey, when I, like, if you work with them, when I see you at work, I'm going to give it to you because that way you won't be busy with this party. And you're like, okay, you have my interest, but cool, cool, cool. So, like, things that don't immediately need the host or hostess's attention are best to give them there. If you do want to bring food and they have agreed that you're going to bring food, it would ideally be food that doesn't need to be heated up at their house because you don't know if they even have oven space or if they have any more place on their stove or whatever, but that it's already ready to just go and ideally, you would even bring your own trivet if you if it's hot, because yeah. you definitely don't want to burn um, a spot in their table because they will remember you always and not necessarily the way you want. So again, thinking ahead about how you can make this the most stress free way to give something to the host or hostess. Yes, something that doesn't require them to do anything during the party. So, like when I went to. A friend's house for Thanksgiving I made the stuffing to bring and so I made sure that I pulled it out of the oven right as it was time to go out the door wrapped it in towels to keep it hot 
Ubered it there. <laughs> like, here we go. It's hot. It's ready to go. So we didn't need their oven or their stove top or anything. Like, nice. But even, and even there, it is always good when you're coordinating that type of stuff to let the host know, though, especially if you're bringing food, what size container you are bringing it in so they have a so they can tell you, like, do they have a space for it? Because not everyone can even, like, especially college kids don't necessarily have space to even put two 13 by 9 pans next to each other. Right. Or like, like if you're bringing something in a slow cooker, they don't necessarily have an extension cord or mm -hmm. a plug near where they have arranged the table and it hasn't occurred to them because they haven't gotten into slow cooker chafing dishes yet. So like it's something to I don't think hostess gifts should be a total surprise. I definitely think hostess gifts should be something that you mention ahead of time. Like I was going to bring a gift. It's this like what do you would you like me to bring you a bottle of wine for you to enjoy and they're like oh you could bring a bottle of wine for the party it is perfectly fine to then bring two bottles of wine one for the party and one for the host to enjoy later to unwind from the stress right but again like something that's not going to stress them out at the party where they suddenly have to accommodate like oh don't you have an ice bucket no i literally do not own an ice bucket like that happens because especially if people live in small apartments, they may just not have the space for that kind of thing. Eva said, I received a housewarming gift, two of them actually. And it's the first time my husband and I received gifts outside of Christmas ever in our lives. And it was so fun. Any gift is great in my opinion. I probably just feel super awkward receiving a gift. So no pressure to bring one either. Hey, LOL. <laughs> um, so it might be something that's dying. I don't know. Like, and I've seen people give um, hostess gifts as bath bombs. Yeah. Again, I really want to talk about it is it is better to talk to your host or hostess ahead of time. For all you know, they don't take baths. They only do showers. Or they don't have a tub. Or they don't have a tub. And it would make them feel bad that they don't get to enjoy this gift. And that's literally not the objective of a gift to make someone feel bad. So while I know most gifts, people like to be surprises, and I get that, the one time when I really think it's not a great idea to give a surprise gift is for hosts for parties, is instead to arrange it ahead of time. And you can say, oh, I'd love to bring you a host gift. Is it okay? Can I bring you bath bombs? Do you take baths? And they might then point out, I don't own a bath. Oh, well, never Give them anymore. a slow cooker. <laughs> People without slow cookers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, here it is. People without slow cookers, I don't think I need to know them. Kidding. I mean, like, I know young people, like, just a fresh out of college who don't own them, you know, or who just got into college. Yes. And I have seen people gift them slow cookers. But again, I would check and make sure they want a slow cooker. Because not everybody wants a slow cooker. Because it turns out some people had traumatic childhoods that centered around slow cookers. And I thought I had heard all the trauma stories about slow cookers. And nope, somebody's always got a new, fresh childhood trauma story to tell me about slow cookers. And my God, slow cookers, a tool of good and evil. So <laughs> it's definitely something to talk about with people ahead of time. It's the one time where I don't think a surprise gift is a great idea. It's for the host of a party. You might want an air fryer instead. Yep. Yep. Or one of those um, electric pressure cookers. Those are fantastic. And many of them have the slow cooker option in them. So, but yeah, but I've asked them, like, I, I know it's contrary to general gift giving, but you don't want to give them something that they can't use. Like also, I've seen people give hosts or hostesses gift cards at parties, but now that means they got to go find their purse or their wallet. People who are hosting at home, even men, do not necessarily have their wallets on them because they're at home. And it's particularly since men usually have their wallets in their back pocket, and most men now know, that is a great way to mess up your hips. If you are into hip pain, you should put your wallet in your back pocket and then sit on it all the time so that you will be sure to have hip arthritis in your old age. So therefore, men know a lot now about don't have your wallet in your back pocket at home so that you have as much time as possible to sit without sitting on this weird thing. 
And so again, even with a gift card, they got to then go find their wallet. Maybe they stash it away in their room and they've locked their room. So nobody goes in their room at the part, you know, the thing. And so even that can be a bit extra work. So it's something definitely to talk about with the host ahead of time where I have seen people and I've read in stories about people dropping off the host gift ahead of the party as a kindness, as a consideration to the host. Mm -hmm. Yes. While, while it's also caused sciatica. I've never seen that word spelled before. The sciatica nerve is a very long nerve. And so if you injure it, you will regret it because uh, let's see, we had an employee once who had injured her sciatica at work. She'd fallen. Uh, she was a night manager at a motel. And what was it? It only heals one millimeter a month. Yeah. And it's like, what is it? 26 centimeters long or something, something insane. Oh no, your sciatica is. I want to say like 60 centimeters long. Yes. So I want you to think about like she had injured three centimeters of it when she fell at work. And so that's 30 months. millimeters. Yep. And it was 30 months that she really was not, she literally could not feel one leg for, I think like at least 18 months. She was pretty much bedridden. Sunny side off. <laughs> Bessie has developed sciatica postpartum because her baby was sunny side. Oh, no. Yikes. Yeah, you need your sciatica to like some stuff. Walk. Yeah. My um, hips have issues, so sometimes they'll just go onto the nerve in my hip oh, joint. Like, yeah. Oh, yay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, all, it just shoots all the way down. Ooh. But yeah, and like host, host gifts are not really expected or required except for formal events. Um, like for friends though, we often do them like, and I have read there. So when I was a teenager in my early twenties, I don't know why, but I was absolutely obsessed with cocktail party stories. Cause I didn't understand cocktail parties. I did not understand this where we're only going to be at a party for two hours. And cause like Southern parties, they go on all night. Um, and so, uh, like, what is this cocktail party where you come at the appointed time and you leave at the appointed time and you just stand around holding a drink and maybe eating little nibbles. Like, what is this? I was just absolutely fascinated. Well, it turns out that cocktail parties were the height of fashion in the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. And for some reason, the Oxford Public Library was filled with these anthology books of short stories and invariably, because these were ancient books, they all had at least one cocktail story in them of like a cocktail party where things happened. And so I read all of them. I was just so fascinated by this culture that like did not exist anymore in the 90s up in Oxford Middle School. I mean, middle um, Oxford, Mississippi. But it sounds like the older version of one time at band camp. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. Like this is like the older I guess the silent generation or the generation before that sort of thing. And so I was reading all these cocktail party stories and I noticed that like often there's, it's usually from the hostess's perspective um, because it's always the hostess, even when it's like a married couple is throwing the cocktail party, it's the hostess who it's the wife who does all the work in these stories. So fascinating. So I guess it was like proto feminist stories now that I think about it out loud. Well, anyway, People in these stories, it's always in New York City, sometimes in Chicago or Washington, D.C., you know, some metropolitan area. And she's like, got to go get ready for all the things. Like she goes to the liquor store and has the liquor delivered to their apartment later. These kind of things. Okay. One of the things I noticed is that if people were dropping off host gifts, they would have them dropped off the day before or the morning or afternoon before the party. And it was usually close friends. And it was often like flowers, having flowers delivered. And they would arrange it ahead of time so the hostess would know. So she would not have to have flowers. Because her friends were having like, they were paying a florist to like make a bouquet and drop it off. 
and and so on and like this was a thing so like maybe instead of flowers it might be a close family friend of the husband would have like a case of champagne delivered again as a gift but to like help the party and this would be because like they're like hit the husband and his best friend are going to get the husband a better job and this is how they're going to do it and they would, they would therefore have this cocktail party and so hence a case of champagne would be delivered um because like, apparently champagne and cocktail parties go together even though that is not a cocktail but okay i'm so, uh, i am who i am so like i remember that like this was and it was like as i said it was 20 30 years that these short stories were published and, you know, often they were published in the New Yorker and even sometimes in the Wall Street Journal, which I did not know the Wall Street Journal used to publish fiction. Mm. Um, and other news periodicals, but there would, but it was, I guess, since cocktail parties were such an important part of the culture back then, there were usually these little stories in there that were supposedly fiction anyway. And they were like almost kind of outlining how cocktail parties should be and how they go and how everyone should behave and what to do with rowdy people, people who are drinking a little too much, a little too fast and can't hold their liquor and so on. So it was like a kind of an examination of this whole subculture of cocktail parties. But that is the one thing I noticed was if you are sending a gift for the party, you're sending it the day before, the morning of, or the afternoon of, but you don't bring it that evening unless you are an inconsiderate person. Because now you are making the host or hostess have to suddenly stop everything they're doing to deal with your gift. And how the wife always felt put upon by his boorish single friends bringing in uninvited guests with them. And also like, why do I have all this meat that I now have to find a place in the refrigerator for, Charles? This was like a thing in these parties, these stories. It would be strange. Why, why would you bring a side of brisket to a cocktail party anyway? I don't know. Why would you Stop give me. the four-year-old a beef tenderloin? <laughs> I believe I get that point. Are you dumb? <laughs> it's just the way some people gift. <laughs> Why would you give meat to a toddler? Can we all hear it? I can hear Garth Brooks. Oh, yeah. So. I mean, but again, like the whole point of a host gift is consideration since they have been considered inviting you to this party you are being considered of them and you know trying to show the same friendship and consideration back which is why yes you are not trying to create more work for the host what will make their life a little bit more enjoyable is what you're supposed to be thinking about for a host gift and yeah and champagne the, and these, some of these stories, like somebody had such a wonderful time at the cocktail party as the cocktail party's ending. They're like, oh, I would love to send you a little gift. Is it okay if I have it delivered on Tuesday? Oh, yes. Uh, the doorman can take it or whatever. Like literally, even if you're not telling them what it is, you're making arrangements for when to actually give it. Yes. Being unsophisticated for a party made me think of that song. Yes. But yeah, like you see though of like how these are all just everyone's supposed to be coming together to have a good time. Mm-hmm. Like play. And I mean, to be perfectly honest, I feel like one of the problems is children are not allowed to throw that many parties anymore. And that is, again, where children learn how to host parties, how to be at parties, so that when they grow up, they know, again, how to do these important things because that really helps you grow your network of supportive friends. Like, and that's kind of what, you know, one of the scenes I always enjoyed watching Peanuts mm -hmm. is there's several of the early special Peanuts specials where someone hosts a party and you see how, and the kids interact like kids. This is not a grow, you know, kids pretending to be grown up. Like this is how yeah. kids interact at parties. Like it's really interesting, but you see how they learn these skills. Although I will say you can tell 
which children have parents who throw parties a lot because of the children's parties I attended when I was young. The ones where the little boy, we're all down in like the den or the basement or wherever. And of course there's a bar and he gets back there and he's like, okay, I have a new drink. Who wants to try it? Everyone else has been to his parties before. I'm like the new person. And they're all like, I want to try. And what is it? You know, it's Coke, orange soda, and Dr. Pepper. You know, he's essentially making cocktails of like kitty drinks. Uh -huh. um, it's high C orange juice and a splash of Dr. Pepper. Real Okay. Um, and they're like, but he's essentially, he's seen enough cocktail parties. He wants to like mimic. Mm -hmm. And that is really important for kids to have an opportunity to where they're how do i say this lightly supervised so there's not an omnipresent experience of an adult there judging and stating their opinion about how all the children are interacting but that in reality of they're like my... lightly supervised because there's an adult within hearing range but who's like hands off yeah my sweet 16 was uh, for my birthday, my mom agreed and cooked for me and my friends a four course dinner. Oh, wow. So we had the long table in the living room. So that was really fun. So like I had all of my friends from high school, all of my band geeks. <laughs> so like that was really fun. So I was basically the hostess while my mother was the server. <laughs> nice. Thank you, mother. Yes, exactly. The cook. She was the cook, too. That's what I'm used to is, like, when children host parties, and I count teenagers as children, like, just for the record, when I'm talking about children. But when children of any age host a party, there's a parent, an adult nearby. Because sometimes mm -hmm. I was hired as the babysitter for children's parties, where the parent is like, I don't want to be part of this nonsense. But I've already made all the food. Here it is in the, in the kitchen. Any, if you need extra sodas, here's where I put it. But, we, you know, me and my husband, we're going to leave. You're the one who's the server. And, you know, your job is to sit here in this chair near the basement and just make sure they know. They know full well they're not allowed to close this door. And you just go down there every 30 to 60 minutes and see if they just need anything like refreshments, need, you know, more snacks. And just make sure everything's fine. They've got their full list of movies they're going to want. They know what they're supposed to do. But just keep an eye. And that's literally what, as a, as a teenager, I would be hired for sometimes. I love those, where they're managing themselves. They know I'm technically there as the supervisor, that I, but I do not want to be there. And so I'm watching TV in the living room with the basement door open and listening to the kids in the den. And, like, occasionally they would call, Hey, Gloria, could you drink down two bottles of pop? Okay, what do you want? You know, and, and so I'm like, and I bring those down like, is everybody good? Yeah, we have a question. It's often a trap. Does <laughs> everybody have a front butt? Like, what? I don't, where did you hear this? I don't know what this is. <laughs> I don't know. We should ask your mom. No, no, we're not going to ask my mom. All right, then. I don't know. Did you look it up in the dictionary? It's not in the dictionary. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what this is. Like, it, when in doubt, act stupid. <laughs> <clears throat> and that is um, my usual approach as a babysitter. Is when in doubt, oh, I have no idea. I'm not worldly like you children. Um, <laughs> but I think children should absolutely be encouraged to host their own parties where there's an adult as a supportive person but not like truly supervising, like directly supervising, I mean, mm -hmm. um, in part so they get practice with there's various kinds of parties. Like, I mean, when I was a kid in the 80s and 90s, children really weren't allowed to have that many regular parties for some reason that had fallen out of fashion. So one of the very few parties left was the sleepover party. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in my early 20s in the 2000s and pretty much the only kind of party other young women were having were sleepover parties. And it's like, we're in our 20s. Why are we still doing this and only this? This is weird. But that was because what that was what we were used to. Mm -hmm. 
So pretty much, like, it was one of the very few parties I could get friends to show up to was like, we're going to have a sleepover. You can sleep in my bed. I got a spare bed. We're going to, you know, have watch Bridget Jones and drink Bloody Marys. You want to come? Oh, yeah, I'll come to that. They come in their PJs just like when we were kids going to sleepovers because that's what they're used to. So I would encourage people be sure to let children have a variety of kinds of parties including afternoon parties, play parties, all sorts of things. And children Growing don't up, want till they have opportunities to do it. Growing up, there were always the midnight Harry Potter book release parties mm. at Barnes & Noble. So I definitely went to those. Those were great fun. So that was, I'd always have a couple of friends and we'd go to Barnes & Noble, like, see you parents in a couple of hours. Mm-hmm. Versus, like, boomers grew up having den parties in the afternoon and having dance parties in the den as well when they got a little older as teenagers. Mm -hmm. That's often what boomers were having was, like, so you see that they still, even now, you know, in their 60s, 70s, uh, are still having those kind of parties. Even though they're not dancing that much anymore. They're mostly sitting there doing sit and be fit in chairs. <clears throat> but I noticed that at the library was the oldest boomers were still like, oh, we should have this kind of party. They'd want that at the library. So we like set up that event for them. People like to have parties that mimic the ones they had as children. So I highly recommend if you have children, be sure to help them host a variety of parties, a variety of times so that they get used to hosting but also they it, let them keep doing it till at least they get a bunch of people start coming so they get used to having larger parties and when i say larger i just mean like more than four children because we also have tea parties yeah tea parties i remember like having like they i think they're I now just to... called princess parties prince and princess parties yeah. So, like, it's one of those of, but if you grew up not being, not having parties, not being allowed to host parties, or just, it was an opportunity, like, honestly, when Tom and I were growing up, our parents never let us have friends over. We were always the kids at other people's houses. We were never allowed to host our own parties at the house. And, like, that was, again, why I was trying to do a party a month for three years, Mm -hmm. was to learn these skills as a young adult because I had not had the opportunity as children. And it was awkward. It was <laughs> fraught with peril. Um, but overall, it was a gratifying experience. I still love it. It turns out I enjoy hosting parties. Um, and there are some people who just prefer to be guests at parties, which is it really, I keep literally, I have a list of people who prefer to be guests, i.e. they will never invite me to any of their parties because they're not their own parties, but they always want to come. And because I need those kind of people at a party because somebody's got to show up. Yeah. Somebody's, you know, people are happy to be guest fillers and like it, but it's an important way to kind of help your social network. It's important if you want your children to have a good social network when they're adults. And it's good practice for when you're adults. Because, again, as you see, not everybody has experience hosting parties. Like, I'm saying, Laura, kind of, you talking about your Sweet 16 party and your yeah. mom helping? Sounds a lot like it kind of echoed your Harry Potter party that you yeah. had for your friends, your work friends. Mm -hmm. And hence, yes, I'm not surprised because it sort of echoes a similar vibe. Yeah. Lots of food. Lots yes. of desserts. Well, it's look, food is, I think food is important at all parties, including cocktail parties. I think it's at all parties. And yes, you can have a non-alcoholic cocktail party. Mm -hmm. I have lots of non-alcoholic cocktail recipes because I grew up in a teetotaling household. Cough, cough. Um, but I love non-alcoholic cocktails. I think that they are delicious. I don't think people try them enough, quite honestly. But it's still fun to like essentially stand around, listen to music, chatting with people, eating little nibbles and drinking various delicious beverages. Mm -hmm. Nobody needs to get inebriated if that's not the vibe they want. Mm -hmm. And it's still fun. Also, I love hearing people's playlists of music. 
because it tells me so much about the person who made the playlist. Yeah. And also, it's a, oh, I love this song. What is the song? This is a cool song. Let me know now. So I need to. Yeah. It's a great way to have a strike up a conversation with someone. I think if you're trying to ease yourself into starting, like to host your first ever party, maybe invite two people over or just host a party for your immediate family. Mm -hmm. Like take that pressure off of 15 guests. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I would definitely go smaller is better. Yeah. Say your first party, it's four or less. This is just a social because you need to, because essentially you're doing a dry run. Yeah. You are testing out your system to make sure you got everything. Because like we said, with the host gifts, people don't realize the things they have and don't have till they're in that moment. Like you may not have the space for a slow cooker. You may or not like, have shoot, I didn't buy ice cooker. this time. Oh, gosh. Oh, God. Our father, it's not a party without a bag of ice. <laughs> There's two things in our father's world that made it a party. You need a bag of ice. And a bowl of French onion dip. Mm -hmm. My God. Like, like, do you need potato chips to go with it? Not necessarily, but it's not a party without French onion dip. And so, like, if we, if I wanted to call it a party, whether it was my party, whether I was going to someone else's party, I, that was like, dad would always ask, or, do they have ice? Should we bring ice? Mm -hmm. And do they have French onion dip? And if I said no... My father's dragging me to Kroger's. Well, you can't come empty handed. Take the French onion. I don't even know there's going to be potato chips. Here's a bag of potato chips. There you go. You will be the hit of the party because you brought French onion dip and potato chips. Sir, the times have changed. People do not care. No, no, it's not a party without French onion dip. Mm -hmm. So he was born in 1940. Is the only thing I could tell you. Gary says last year. Just before Christmas, we hosted a small game night slash sent peanut to grandma's. I made some munchy food and it was me, Joe, Bestie, and her husband, and a couple I know from junior high. It was a blast. We played Cards Against Humanity and told stories till almost midnight. Sounds yeah. fantastic. Sounds like the old car parties, honestly. I say one of the other things um, I feel, especially for smaller parties where it's it's not a milling around party, but a a chatting party. Yeah, everybody. <laughs> it is always it. best to have at least three game options mm -hmm. that people can play without really knowing the game in advance. Yes. Like, one of the, like while I love that there has been in the last decade, um, it, well, last two decades, really, this boom in board games and tabletop games, mm -hmm. a lot of them require an hour or two just to learn the rules to play. Oh, God, yeah. yeah. And those are not party games. Those My are dad will not even sit through the rules. Yeah. Yeah, like versus so, what what was the one Terry used to recommend? Flux. Yeah. Flux. Like you can learn how to play fl flux in less than five minutes. And I challenged him once and he was absolutely actually right. It was three minutes. But yeah, so and, it was like flux, uh, phase ten. What uh, Uno, ones that you can tell the rules and can ha can you can have multiple numbers of people that's not just one on one. Right. Because or one night ultimate werewolf, because the app has the instructions and will tell you each round who does yeah. what. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's nice. But yeah, like again, like our father's generation, it was bridge. Everybody on the planet his age and his mother's age knew how to play bridge. And they played it incessantly. Um, uh, and like, so like people would host bridge parties at night for mixed couples, you know, of men and women. And that you just need two, what was it? Grandma said you just needed two card tables, uh, probably two to three decks of cards, just to be sure you have on hand. And one of them had better be sealed. Oh, my God. Grandma was so, it's got to be sealed because arguments happen. So, I just inherited my grand, two of my grandpa's decks of cards. Yes. And so, like, she's like, and then you need some snacks. You could just buy a, a container of mixed nuts. And, you know, she's like, look, even if you don't drink soda and some ice, you have a party. You can all play bridge or whatever. And I'm like, Grandma, I ain't nobody playing bridge anymore. But, it, <laughs> oh, let me tell you the sadness on my grandmother's face. Like, her face really did say, I don't wish to live into the 21st century if they're not playing bridge. And, y'all, she died right before the 21st century because she was like, mm -hmm. I don't want to be there. Um, I love Spence. I'd be like, <laughs> we, we play Betrayal at House on the Hill at parties. 
And I love that one as a board game because while it is more interactive, it has definite role-playing elements. Mm -hmm. Nobody sets out at the beginning to play a certain way. Nobody feels called out. It is a random game. And it's just, in the end, how did we play the game? You know, like, <coughs> versus someone going like, oh, I won, because half the events in, in that game are random. It's I found uh, at game night at the library, the one that the kids today love, and granted, I would just want to make, to clarify, kids today was six to ten years ago. So I guess they're Gen Zs, so I don't know what the alphas are playing. But Gen Z kids, uh, supposedly, at least in South Mississippi, love playing apples to apples. Because, again, you can learn to play that in, what, three minutes or less? At least the basic version. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's good even for low literacy kids. You know, kids who maybe don't know how to read yet are not strong readers anyway. They can still play along and feel like they're equals. Uh, and everyone can enjoy it. And so I expect apples to apples to get a resurgence in what, about 10 more years? Yeah. Once if those kids are like starting to host their own parties yeah. in their like early to mid 20s. If you want something that's like Cards Against Humanity, but more children appropriate, there's a game called Not Parent Approved. So nice. if you have kids wanting to host a party, we would play that one. Oh, it does remind me like the one when I was in my 20s that everyone played among the nerds and geeks, and I've still got all of them, is uh, Munchkin. Yes, I was just thinking that. I'm literally looking at people will find out that Tom plays Munchkin and donate packs to him or give them to me to give to him. I just realized this game it is Flux. I have Monty Python You have Flux. Monty Python yep. Flux. Yeah, everybody's got at least one deck of Flux somewhere. I've never played I, be, I genuinely believe that, like, there are tiny um, black holes in most apartments and houses, and out of that will shoot a gate, a box of flux eventually, like, if you just give it time. Uh, Carrie says, I played Apples to Apples. It's fun. Also, the game of things. So, and Ava points out, there's, ki we're both clicking. There's Kids Against Humanity, but I think it's maybe too much for kids, to be honest. Like, my kid doesn't get it. It may be, I think kids... Kids Against Humanity is for more like upper elementary school age. So it just may be that he's just give him a couple more years. He'll grow into it. Um, Ava's never heard of Flux. I didn't hear of Flux until I was a librarian. There often you can find them at garage sales or you can buy them on Amazon for literally like five to ten dollars. Sometimes um, they go on sale for like four or five dollars, uh, which is how I picked up my own copy. Actually, I told some of the kids at game night and one of them literally came and donated a box to me personally. So that is how I have a box of flux. It is fun. Um, another one, because I saw, you know, Carrie point out when Bessie hosts her game nights, there's the adult game table and the kid games, meaning the young kids all went to play video games. Is yeah. There's nothing wrong with playing video games. But it does help if it's not just two. So like Mario Party, um, mm -hmm. where you can usually play with at least yeah. four people. Yeah, Tom actually good. was setting up his laptop because I've never played Mario Party in my life. I've only heard about it. And Tom's like, oh, we're going we gonna to do this on the TV. And I'm like, cool. Let's, let, let me see how Mario Party is. What have I been missing from the youth today? Uh, and I know youth today, Mario like Kart. 15 years ago, Smash. the Mario Party was a big deal. But, um, like, yeah, kids playing video games, uh, like, especially if they're invited, allowed to bring, invite their own friends or neighborhood kids to it, that is an absolutely valid form of play as long as everybody remembers the good sportspersonship rules, which is everybody gets a, a, a turn at the controller, and that if people are getting a little too involved about winning or losing, it's time to take a break, come down and get snacks. Everybody needs to calm down because it's not meant to be a miserable experience. Uh, and that no fighting. If you're getting into a physical scuffle, again, it's time to take a break. And maybe that game will not be played for the rest of the night. Again, so everyone can have a good time and not have to worry about physical altercations. And I think that's true of adults too. 
Because when we lived glory. in the commune, we all went through a massive rummy phase. Every night was a party basically because of the open door policy, and we were always playing. Yep, Tom and I still love playing rummy. Uh, rummy was a phase of my life, too. Yep. Uh, Carrie says, one game night, the kids broke out the rock band and blasted the volume for about one song before we all made them turn it down. Yes. Um, but yeah, again, like it's wonderful to have a party where there's an adult section and a kids section. And because again, the kids get to practice playing, having a party while still, you know, essentially being lightly supervised so that if something goes wrong or they just need more food, <clears throat> there's still adults to help, but they're getting that opportunity barely supervised. So it's it's a good way because again, this is helping them develop friendships so that they have that skill when they're adults. And mm -hmm. if you did not get that experience as a child, I would like to highly encourage that you look at your life and say, how can I start developing these skills now? It is never too late because it'll make your writing better. It will possibly help enrich your own supportive network of friends. And remember you need that support. All of us do. If you want to prevent cognitive decline, improve your mental health, your physical health, and your general outlook on life, it has to do with how supportive is your network. So, you know, give it a try. Even if that means you do baby steps, like just inviting one or two people over to play cards or play a board game or watch a movie, all of that is a valid form of parties. Okay? Or just have tea. Or just have tea or go meet at a park and take pictures. It is still a social engagement. I'm going to be honest with you. Two people is a get together. Three people's a party. You can have a little picnic party at the park and then go take pictures of things. Here, let us go look at nature and take pictures. And then put them in your journal. Put them in your journal. Like, people go, well, it's not really a party if we're all just taking pictures. Like, uh, it is absolutely a valid form of a party. Plus, you'll have images of the nature. And maybe you'll take a picture of another human being. How cool would that be? <laughs> it's, it's absolutely a valid form of a party. You did things together for a little bit of time. It's wonderful. A TikTok party. <laughs> oh I mean, look, if someone was like, hey, we're going to have a TikTok party. And we're going to make TikToks and help each other with our TikToks and be like, great, I would totally love to learn how to make one. Uh, and hoping the young people will show me how to edit them. Um, <laughs> because I'm always looking for new skills. Yeah, I mean, yeah. People love to come together to do an activity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like That is a good way to do it. It is like, well, who wants to come together and we'll do this. I mean, that's, that's how, you know, young photographers and models do is like, we're all going to come together. We're all going to model and photograph each other and figure out what we're doing. Mm -hmm. My sister did a photo shoot uh, with a roommate in college where they dressed all in black and like did like grease paint and uh, hid in the dumpsters <laughs> in the college. And they were like sneaking around the, uh, the building, oh, no. the exterior of the buildings. <laughs> just doing photo shoots with them being creepers and campus patrol found them they're like we'll leave you to it <laughs> but they had a blast i mean that's the important part <laughs> it is so yeah you can totally have fun just doing a photo shoot yeah just i mean like um <clears throat> way back in the day about what six years ago so long ago. I know. It was so long ago. I had um, several people say how much they would love to learn how to take pictures of food. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, let's do a little event together. And I catered it. And my other friend, who's also really good at taking food pictures, came. Agreed. She, I talked to her about it. And she agreed to come. And I invited everybody who would ever said that they wish they were better at taking pictures of food. And I made a whole buffet of things and um we eat, everybody brought their prettiest plates and dishes and things and we like we she and i talked about our approach to taking pictures of food with our phones and with better cameras i also brought my better camera um so people could see like what we're doing 
And then everybody took turns taking pictures and helping each other with their content. And then at the end, because I made food that was delicious at room temperature, you know, picnic food, we then ate. And we all sat around eating and chatting and talking and just getting to know each other. And it was a super fun content creation party. Mm-hmm. And, um, of course, as always, it was wonderful to eat afterwards. It was super yeah. fun. We, d- we did it outside. So we also could do fresh air pictures and, and all this. It was lovely. And the food was fantastic. And if you it don't is- want to do, like, a, a bar with, like, alcohol at your party, what we had ongoing through all of Christmas this year was an Italian cream soda bar. Mm, nice. So we just had all the syrups lined up on the counter. We had a whole thing of cream in the fridge. We had bottles and bottles and bottles of sparkling water. And we would just do mm-hmm. so many Italian cream sodas. But it nice. was amazing. So like there are, are fun alternatives that are still Oh, yeah. Us. Like, we've done, like, juice bars instead. Mm-hmm. Like, because, like, in South Mississippi, you can't have like alcohol pretty much anywhere that's not a bar or a restaurant that has a liquor license so you can't have them at parks you cannot drink at parks you can't even just have alcohol on the premise in the parking lot in the car at a park you will go to jail Mm -hmm. so uh like we've set up juice bars before and encouraged people to mix various juices so we had shakers and yes people already called the cops and then they showed up and they're like, we were told there's alcohol. And we're like, behold, there is no alcohol. However, we are mixing up various juices. Would you like to partake? And they've tried and went, oh, this is actually Because a lot of them don't know, like, mango juice is fantastic when you add it to any of the other juices here. You know, having cranberry juice and pineapple juice and orange juice and all sorts of other juices and guava juices. And they're like, oh, this is actually quite delicious. Of, like, we've done that before, like a whole little juice bar, and it's super good. Um, okay. Like every time I'm about to read one, you take it away. So I'm not oh, going to try to read them anymore. Eight. Really? Nope. See, you have to read them yourself. I'm done. Eva mentions Halloween parties are a thing here. You're all invited to hang out in my driveway on Halloween any year. <laughs> <clears throat> said some houses have shops and others have food. Chili specifically. <clears throat> Did you know that chili is the official food of Halloween, apparently. Oh. So, yeah, like, as I said, any kind of party, like I used to host parties when I was teaching and we would have popcorn parties or root beer float parties or a pickle party once. they want The kids wanted a pickle party. All these parents and caregivers showing up with various bottles of pickles because the kids, some of these bottles were half the size of the child that the parent was bringing it for. And I'm like, how will we, how will you take it home? This is a, this is like a two gallon jar of pickles. <laughs> and they're like, I don't know. I'll tell my mother. <laughs> okay. But like, um, like they wanted a pickle party. So they got to try all the pickles. I don't know. They, mm-hmm. cutting them up. they were like, can you cut them? I don't want a whole pickle. Pancake parties. You name it. Like around here, uh, what is it? The Kiwanis host regular. Kiwanis Club? Yeah, the Kiwanis Club yeah. hosts regular pancake fundraiser parties. Or spaghetti parties. The mm-hmm. The Catholics around here do uh, spaghetti supper fundraisers a lot. Who hurt you, Spence? Everybody's got their thing. Um, versus the Lutherans host sausage parties. And I mean that. And they make their own sausages. So it's a valid, it's a valid party. Um, but that like, yeah, why, why is the food religious denomination specific? Um, for these, but yeah, there's various. I mean, there is the Lutherans. I just said the Lutherans hold oh. their sausage party and they, yeah. you were literally here. I was distracted by the conversations about jello shots. Mm, okay. And the lack of decent jello shots. And it's like, yeah, like most people do not know how to make a good jello shot, but the ones that do, those are delicious. Mm-hmm. How, Spence. how much has Spence been hurt? Plenty. Barbecue. 
Why? Why did Noah not tell me any of these things when I asked about family food preferences or food allergies or anything? Like, Spence, you need to work on that one. I believe it was Noah's plan to have it all to himself. Selfish, selfish, selfish. Mm -mm 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 -mm. But yeah, like, you can host any kind of party, especially if you can find out what do like even just four people you know like food wise? We're having a chocolate party. I used to host sushi parties at the library. There was no raw fish involved. Um, but like I learned how to make sushi rice. I followed the directions. It was great. And we would roll our sushis together. Everybody I would know how to make musubi. We would all try each other's sushis or not. It depended. And it was great. You name it, you can do it. I mean, you could definitely, you could have a Canadian culture night. Make your own poutine. <laughs> Nanaimo bars. Mmm, that's some good stuff. I grew up on those. My mom would make them. Yeah, they're yummy. They are super de delicious. Mm hmm so, on that note, I think we're pretty much wrapped up for the day. Um, I have no idea what next week's going to be about. Stay tuned. Something amazing. Aw, thank you. Uh, the vote of confidence is appreciated, if not founded. So <laughs> <laughs> but we will have to Despite me being in a rolling chair, I am grounded. <laughs> what did you say, Tom? But we will figure it out by Wednesday night on Twitch. Yeah, we got we got a day or two to figure this out. Maybe three days. So thank you all so much for being here and hanging out with us. We shall wave you off to the sunset and hopefully see some or most or even all of you in the Discord server in a little bit. Hey, that would be cool. We're going to go to the clubhouse. Good night, y'all. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Good night. <laughs> Thank you.